Welcome to the Mortal Realms. It's off there. An Age of Sigmar story phase. Grab your hammer so we can clear a path through the chaos and forge our own narratives in the Age of Sigmar. In this episode, we cover Nagash, Undying King by Josh Reynolds. Nurgle's Order of the Fly invades Shyish in order to strike Nagash while he is the weakest. And your allies through the realm gate this episode are... I'm Davey. I've been taking a little bit easy lately. Uh, it's just because I think less Tark is more Tark sometimes. Uh, that one caught me off guard. Uh, I'm, I'm Aaron, and uh, I've never read a book as fast as I've ever read this one before. And my name is Paul, and I can hardly believe I got this book finished. And I am Eric, Fred Man Walking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is I where I read the in this episode part, but I switched it to the beginning part. So now, how are you doing tonight? <laughs> Doing good. I'm doing great. I'm doing real Punchy. good. We thought we'd start this episode earlier tonight, but that didn't work out. So we're a little <laughs> punchy. We're a little silly. Um, and uh, we're, we're excited to be recording tonight. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time before we dive into the book talking a little bit about Adepticon. Because half of us were able to go and the other half are... Ooh. The worst half. Super awesome. Because we know... What suckers are like. Anyway, so, Paul. Yeah. How did you like Adepticon? It was amazing. Cool. Let's get into the book. Sounds good. (laughs) Now, Paul, how many times have you been to Adepticon? Eight or nine. I can't remember. Unreliable source, then. Maybe it's one. Oh, I've always been an unreliable source. It's more Uh, than one. People know me. I don't know if you know this, but people know me. People know you on the internet. I have been there... Equal to one times. Uh, this was my first time. Uh, I'd heard good things. You guys have all heard good things. It's the largest miniatures convention in the world. I think last year they had about uh, 4,000 people. I don't know what the final attendance was this year. Um, there were, uh, for our, like what we're interested in, I think there were, what, one, two, three, four, five AOS events, two Vanguard events, a narrative event run by Paul here, a doubles event, and then the two-day championship, 2,000 points. Mm-hmm. Um, I, Paul, you showed up the earliest. When did you get there? I got there Wednesday morning right around noon. And what was going on right around noon? Paint us a uh, picture. So, was it cloudy out? Walk into the convention space. There's a bright sunlight streaming through the window. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Just lights this perfect picture. How you warm was it? It was about 40 degrees. Okay, cool. <laughs> and it was about 40 degrees in the convention hall because we actually moved rooms this year. So we were in a big cement hall instead of a smaller carpeted area. Uh, and you walk in and there's just row after row after row after row of table. And sitting at the end is Domus. And we spent the morning... Uh, slash afternoon, setting up all the tables for the AOS championships. So they start out doing a, a smaller number for the Vanguard, and then they gradually add to them as the weekend goes on. So you've got more tables for the team tournament and then more tables for the AOS championship itself. Uh, so I walked in, and uh, Domus was there, uh, and then Mitzi and Jimbo came down, started out hanging out, having a great time. Um, and then we all went to the hotel bar, because we couldn't be bothered to do anything else at that point once the tables have been set up. Uh, And then we were going to go wait in line for registration, but then we decided we'd rather drink a little bit longer. So then we ended up standing in line for the studio preview. Um, And so I got to sit in the second row with Mitzi and Jimbo to my left and Vince Venturella and Tom Lyons to my right. Um, So we got to watch that GW preview video in person, and that was just absolutely incredibly amazing. Probably the highlight would be watching the sisters video, all the comments filtering in, and nobody knew that it was going to be a sisters video at the start. And then as soon as they started talking about girls and that I want sisters, I look over at Vince, and I just see this huge, silly smile on his face. And then he just, like, relaxes completely into his chair, as in, like, finally, I'm going to get what I want. So uh, that was amazing. Um, 
And then uh, Thursday was the 1,000-point Vanguard event. I played in that. Did okay. Uh, and then... Well, real quick, up, Aaron, you know, what were you doing Wednesday night during this it. announcement? Oh, I was having a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, no, we were... I was playing all sorts of games, and... Uh, well, yeah. You and I were hanging out. Waiting, oh, yeah. Waiting for the announcements to peel over into yeah, the like, community page. I was, was trying to make it. I was trying to. Yeah, I was trying to make it more exciting, man. No, Come on. No, we were <laughs> like the only like exciting for us would have been like spiking our peach tea <laughs> while we're relaxing <laughs> the you know on the deck. Sure. I filed like a a stormcast. Okay. I think so. I mean, it's productive. <laughs> All right, continue, Paul. Uh, Thursday was the morning vanguard, and then we had the narrative event in the afternoon. Um, so that was a pretty pretty awesome time. I was really nervous going into it because I've never run a narrative event with my own scenario, everything from scratch. Uh, we ended up having a central table where everybody put a battle line unit that was going to represent their hero for the rest of the, the afternoon. We fought a battle against witch elves, and every hero or every battle line model, excuse me, was killed and then was raised. They got kicked out of the Gibbering Dome, and then every character, according to their own story, um, basically toured the world and built up an army in order to come back and to recover what was taken from them in the Gibbering Dome. So there was a more substantial battle that was kind of the focus of the actual straight-up AOS, where they started in the beginning, the entrance of the Gibbering Dome, and fought their way into the center hall. There were some special rules regarding that. So for anything that flew on a four plus, they took a mortal wound. Uh, Chuck Moore was gracious enough to allow us to fight with his uh, Daughters of Cain army. So the four plus for flying was due to the Canari that were flying in the ceiling. So you didn't want to fly up too high, otherwise you might take some damage. Um, if you shot anything over 18 inches, you were going to take a shot on a four plus from the Malusai that were defending their prey, uh, their righteous kills that they were looking to turn into statue. And then on a four plus, if you did a wound of three, three or more to a model, you took some damage from the hags for taking their blood, their blood sacrifice. Um, there were also a couple other small special rules. We had a sworn protector rule where you could ally with another model that gave you a plus one to your armor save, or excuse me, plus one to your save, you had to use the lowest movement and the highest bravery. Uh, but the rule that caused the most interesting um, stories and really kind of made it happen was I didn't want everybody to run through the halls too quickly and make it to the center. It was a four-hour event, so I wanted to make it worth the four hours. So every unit that was put on the board, on a four-plus, they were required to later in the turn move and then charge the nearest non-friendly unit. So if you allied yourself to another model... You are welcome to do that. You gain that plus one save. And that specific hero that you allied yourself to was considered a friendly model, but their army was not. So there was a lot of back and forth uh, attacking from model to model and winnowing down those armies. Um, the four plus was in there to reflect the fact that the gibbering dome was steeped in blood magic. So the event was basically made to create a narrative. It wasn't to create a... Um, we're going to fight to the death and whoever killed the most things wins. It's your battle line model that becomes your hero is the story. And you need to get your hero to the center of the building and recover that item. And in order to facilitate that, if your hero died, they got brought back. If they had a sworn protector, they would have to attack and try to kill the protector that failed to protect them. If not, they were allowed to place their model anywhere on the board and take revenge on any model they wanted to. At the end of the game, that allowed us to move everybody back to the center of the board to try and recover their item that was at the top of the temple in the center of the dome. We had one of the players who decided that he was going to ally with the Daughters of Cain instead of the other players at his table. So his hero was allowed to run up and grab their item. And then his hero, we talked it over and was allowed to spawn a greater demon of Nurgle. So the players had to fight their way up the stairs through hordes of Daughters of Cain models. Um, specifically witch elves, and then at the top there was a huge uh, greater demon of Nurgle. And if their hero was able to recover their item, they won the game. There was no battle points or anything else that made a difference. 
And it was really interesting and really fun watching everybody play out that narrative. Um, it ended up being a really good time. I was really stressed about it, but it turned out to be a lot of fun. Uh, and I got a lot of good feedback on it. So it was a cool time. Nothing to stress about. Everybody knew you were going to do great. <laughs> except, except, for, for me, except for David. <laughs> Davey, did, you, did Davey doubt him? <laughs> Nothing no. the doubts. Can't, can't, def- can't doubt. defend himself. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's cool, man. Yeah, first first narrative event at Acon? Uh, right. that's, that's the first one, I believe, for an AOS. There was actually a narrative event that was running for 8th edition, and I think it kind of carried over. Uh, okay. But uh, it didn't show up on the schedule this year, and I don't remember seeing it next year, last year. So I figured, was... I figured if you dare eight or nine years... You would know historically, definitively, historically, uh-huh. but maybe not. Paul doesn't remember what happened yesterday, so let's. <laughs> what unreliable day? source. Uh, <laughs> so then on Friday, I took a day off, took the painting classes, took one with Duncan in the morning, which was awesome, on Metallics. Took one on Vince in the afternoon, which was amazing. Um, it was just a great time, kind of my day off, because I know if I play Thursday, Friday, Saturday for AO, Saturday, Sunday for AOS, I just complete, get completely burned out. Yeah. Um, I got uh, there on Friday morning. Yep, you got there on Friday morning. Um, I took, I did, I scheduled nothing for Friday. I just wanted to be able to like have kind time. Of, kind of lazy. Well, a little I, bit, a little bit. I, so I had two things I had to do. One, <laughs> I had to meet everybody I could possibly meet that I'd never met before. Except for on the tweets. Sure. And then I had to p- make sure I passed out the like six sets of tokens and dice. And so I like, I thought I might have to do a lot of running around and like finding people where they might be if they weren't playing the event, if they're somewhere else. But they lined up for you instead because they got to get their hands on those sweet tweet <laughs> dice. I mean, it had a booth set up. There was a big sign and everything. He was just standing there. Everybody was just lining up to get his autograph on their Mortal Realms narrative shirts. It was, it was amazing. It was weird. It, yeah, I, did, I didn't even I didn't even bring a booth, and there was one. Sure. I didn't even schedule myself to be part of the the exposition, also, but I was. New idea. We should sign dice. Like that's that's a money maker right there. <laughs> There's only four of us. There'd be two blank sides. Sure, dibs on six. I was just gonna sign on the in the M. One of us would sign an M on each of them, and a pack of eight, you get two signatures, right? You only get one A though, Aaron. That's not. Come on, man. A, that's, a, not, that, that's, not, that's not me. That's not how I do. Budget constraints. You have to get yeah. a level of each kind. Tell me more but, about Adepticon. But obviously, it was uh, it was cool meeting everybody. There was a huge uh, couple of things that surprised me. One, there was a much bigger UK contingent than I expected. Oh my goodness, um, so many people. I knew that. I knew that. Uh, you know, Mitzi and and uh, Jimbo Nine Jimbo were coming. Um, I knew that. Uh, I think we'd heard that the face hammer guys were coming. I wasn't sure the you you know there's some of the um, Elon hammer guys uh, were coming, including um, uh, Hobby Killer. Um, and they're, they're, they're and trying then, to reconquer us, maybe. I, that's what it was the British I, invasion. It absolutely was. Okay. was. Okay. They were kind of recolonization. To all the medals. Sure. All right on. Medals. Well, I'm glad you guys fought them off. It, Continue. It was definitely more of a colonialization than a, a Beatles thing. <laughs> I mean, British Invasion, it would have been cooler if it was a Beatles thing, but I was okay with it as it was. Sure. So are sure, Flitter sure. Furies Beatles? Because Mitzi brought Flitter Furies, so that would kind of count as a Beatles invasion? That's not what we're talking about. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> kind of Beatles. Paul's, Paul's uh, rampant Anglophilia, though, he was probably screaming like those crowds. Oh, my Beatles, goodness. Like. It was amazing. <laughs> it was fantastic. I was giving hugs out left and right. It was, now, it was here's crazy. the other crazy thing. Um. There were it's the team tournament. There were eight teams from Milwaukee, which what? is an hour and forty five minutes to our east. I can see Milwaukee from what, my house. An hour and forty five minutes to drive to Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, who takes an hour and forty five minutes to drive to Milwaukee? I guess I usually go downtown. <laughs> so, but what about Milwaukee? So it. there was like there was like a ton of people coming from the Milwaukee Milwaukee scene, mm-hmm. uh, and I felt a little bit like one. This, our scene's been kind of growing-ish, right? Here in Madison, the stores are kind of competing a little bit more for people. Sure. Uh, you know, a little more, there's more turnout each week, more games being played each week. Um, but, like, I haven't heard much from Milwaukee, and that's just because we're just not as connected as we were back in the WWHFB days. 
just rolls off. The <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> WWHFB.com days, uh, bulletin board days. Um, but they're just, I guess they're cruising over there. And there's a, a, a tournament happening in a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, yep, April 28th. That that Boom, that's me. I'm a chump. Yay. More mm-hmm. on that later. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was in- interesting though because I got to meet a, a number of uh, Milwaukee guys that I, I you know I've not been over there in a long times for yeah I don't think I've been over there for but when we had mayhem here in town a lot of them would come over this way so yeah it was uh, very cool a huge, a huge shout out to Heath Ryan because uh, he seems to be kind of the focus that everybody's kind of rallying around he's uh, an awesome guy he played in the narrative he played in the teams um, he was handing out coffee. To everyone at the Depticon and the championships, um, he's just a great guy, a great player, um, and really is a great focus. Uh, especially during the narrative event, he went out of his way to make sure that everybody was playing the game, enjoying themselves. Um, and there was really not a strong Milwaukee community. Well, I'll take that back. There was a strong Milwaukee community before AOS, but uh, when AOS dropped, we lost a lot of the old regulars. And Heath has really done a great job of introducing those new regulars onto the scene and getting them into the tournaments and stuff. I think this was the first one he was actually able to go to. Yeah. Um, so it was awesome. It was a lot of fun to watch all these guys coming out and hanging well, out. It sounds like the, the story I heard was that a couple of them showed up last year at, at Adepticon and uh, Domus and Rillian and a few others really kind of welcomed them in, uh, you know, got them encouraged. Uh, some of the other Milwaukee people had just stepped down like for Akon to see things or whatever. Yep. And they got so excited in jazz that this year they decided to come in full force. So uh, yeah. we've got to figure out how to make uh, – well, and while down there, I did see quite a few um, Madison crew, um, a couple – one of the mats from uh, the the Warhammer store, um, mm-hmm. uh, a few other people that I'd kind of known but didn't – I don't know them well. Um, and I know there's, uh, you know, Mitchie and a few of the, the 40K players – uh, yeah. We're down. I didn't see get to see them down there, but I got a text with them afterwards, and say, they said they had a really great time. So Kenny, Kenny was there too, right? Yeah, Kenny. Oh, yeah, was, Kenny was absolutely there. He was. Oh, he's every. He's always there and everywhere. So, so there. <laughs> I forgot. Well, actually, Kenny. He's, he's just in the other room right now. So he's just right. Nice. <laughs> he's everywhere. Um, but yeah, so Madison, there's there was a, you know, a handful of Madison crew in the Adepticon as a whole. It'd be awesome to to uh, go full force for. AOS. Um, but then we got uh, to championship on uh, Saturday. Uh, so that was five games over two days. Um, 2,000 points. Two hour and 45 minute rounds. I was dead worried leading up to Akon that I was going to accidentally dead. slow pay. Dead slow, worried though? Slow play the, uh. the heck out of my army. And so I was I was pretty nervous. I, was, I don't think I'd changed like, lists so many times. Uh, leading up to an event. Um, once I had it down, though, I didn't change it after I got there, um, like some people did. Tom <laughs> Lyons. Um, he, he changes Paul, all the time. Or Paul Wagner. This. I didn't change my list. You just had no idea what it list. was. You just didn't know. <laughs> I literally had no idea. What if, it was. if there's no list, is it really changing it? Yeah. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. I knew what the models were going to be on the table. I just didn't know what rules I was going to use. <laughs> you didn't know what they were going to be. <laughs> and you still don't, so. from what I from what no, I. No, 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 I don't. You don't remember. Unbeknownst to Alex, I ran my own five-game narrative event. <laughs> so, uh, but that was cool. I mean, I had um, I had five really cool games. Uh, was in my fifth game, I was able to play somebody who used to live in Madison that uh, transferred, uh, moved uh, for work down to Illinois. So it was cool seeing him. Um, I got to play a huge variety of army, and I didn't hit Zinch or Stormcast a single time. Which is probably why I made it as high at tables as I did. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been pretty low. I think. Nice. Now up, up. Yeah, I ended up uh, being able to play Zach from Milwaukee, Alex from Minneapolis. Alex, um, what's up, buddy? Yep. And uh, there is also, I believe his name was Steve, but I'm probably getting it wrong. From uh, near the like Ottawa a, region. He sounds like a Steve. Yeah. yeah, he's about an hour outside of Ottawa, but he was he was a lot of fun to play with. Um, and, uh, then I, on the second day I ended up playing, um, Phil from Milwaukee. And then my last game is against Mike Ballard, who was actually my fourth or fifth round opponent last year. At Ballard, so, all right, cool. well, nice. not from Steven's point. He's from another area. So 
I don't know. There's two of them, which is the weirdest thing in the world. I'm like, there's no way Mike Valley is playing. Oh, right. There's a different Mike Valley. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it was amazing. Everybody, uh, my first game against Zach was he had Ziffle and Clown Car, and I didn't have much chance with my list. Uh, he got first turn, and then he got priority. Uh, but he was willing to do some narrative shenanigans with me after uh, the game was kind of decided, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, I have one really brave grot with a yellow uh, handkerchief on his head, and one of my gun haulers developed quite a big ego as well, so that was pretty fun. Second game um, really pushed the narrative a lot, and we started just giving out wounds every time the boats blew up, and it wasn't in the spirit of the tournament, but it was great. Um, and Alex was right along there with me taking wounds on his models as well, so that was a lot of fun. My third game against Steve, I was a little bit closer, so we didn't add any narrative rules in. We just had a good time. And then my fourth game against uh, Phil, he was just going full on in the narrative with me. So we did the exploding boat, and then he decided he needed to have a narrative rule where his dreaded Saurian was acting like a big dog and going after all the balls of the engines in my army, and then running after his Slon to try and return it, but that he was <laughs> Slon was using his teleport to get him away because he didn't want to be mauled to death. So it was it was good times. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I did not get last by, by one place, <laughs> but, which, yeah, in a way, is a uh, is a victory. At the winning, like completely, considering that I literally won no games and no one else at the tournament didn't win a game, I considered a victory that, that I did not. Difficult get last. to believe, but it's possible. <laughs> like, ser- all right, one player so and nobody else went zero and five. Like, nobody else went zero and five. Everybody got a game. I don't know. At least that's what the score set when I read it. So maybe yeah. the double, the, the secondary was in one place and the tertiary was in a different, and that got edited up. So that's possible. Uh, but we'll, we'll um, crunch, we'll crunch those numbers. Uh, no. Paul, I just want you to know that, like, that makes me feel kind of bad because at Mary Mayhem in like 2014, maybe mm-hmm. you beat you beat me in eighth, and so like like <laughs> transitive property, that means I got no wins in a deck to count this year, which is kind of that's kind of no. Bummer. Sorry. Aaron, you win but, all the games you never play. So yeah. <laughs> I think Wayne Gretzky said <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although Paul uh, was way better in eighth. Sure. I was way better in eighth. I was winning tournaments, not on the bottom, but legitimately my dice were just terrible. I was I didn't set out to play five narrative games. Oh. I set out to do well at the tournament, but I wasn't remembering rules. My dice were terrible. Yeah, I don't think you can blame your yeah. dice if you don't remember any of the rules of your army. Well, but hold on. No, no, no. I, I don't. Have... I do not want dice stories. Like, let me oh, make, be perfectly clear about something here. <laughs> all right, Tom. Tom I sec. I'll I second that. Perfectly yeah. clear. <laughs> um, guys, give me, give me, the, give me some the biggest highlight of Depticon. I have four. No, that's okay. Oh, we'll sorry. pick one. That's how biggest works. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I gotta think about it for a while. Then give me all a second right. to do this. All right. Uh, Eric, we'll my, get into it. Mine was one hundred percent. Um, the community that showed up. Um, like so we've. I've been to Wapaka, I've been to Mayhem, I've been to Havoc a couple of times. And Be careful what you say. There's always a lot of fun. I mean, there's and the people are always great. This felt like like family that hadn't seen each other in a long time. Like it felt like a family reunion, uh, and everyone's playing the same game. Um, you know, which which just I don't know, just seemed like it. Everyone was just. Uh, I don't know whether that's just because of t- the size of it. You get so many more people there, and it's it's just bigger feeling or if it was just that so many people coming from different areas right they're not just your back you know the people you see all the time at events or kind of your your backyard uh, crew i guess i don't know um i also say this is that that feeling you know so when i just dropped in on packet this year i had that feeling just walking in the door yeah uh, talking to people three i think it's some of it's just like you know the more of these events you go to the more that builds i think the more and more now all of a sudden you walk in and you know Domus. You played Domus a bunch of times, or you know, a, a couple times now. You know, like they're they're just all yep. of a sudden you you've you've built up some history with some folks. So uh, I'm not uh, discounting the awesome atmosphere that Adepticon brings, but I think also as you get more events under your belt, you'll feel that feeling more and more, and it'll be less dependent on. That's a lot of what people are excited about going to Wapaka for. You know, absolutely. I, I agree with you. And that's, I think this may have been the first place. So I, I mean, maybe when I went to PACA, I was kind of new to going to events. Exactly. Um, when we went to Havoc, you know, that definitely felt more. We've been there twice and some of those same people. Um, this was a, a, you know, confluence of all the people we've been talking to uh, on Twitter for the last three years. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, just 
a lot of people that were just like open to like those friendships. So yeah, I think you're right. It's just a uh, time in the community. So for me, this was kind of a, an apex of, of time in the community and, and uh, you know, that felt really good to me and I'm excited yeah, to go to more events and feel more of that love. Oh, awesome. Paul, I want to hear your, your highlight, but I just want to warn you that like, if you don't also say the community, you're going to seem like a big jerk. Go. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like first and foremost, like Mitzi and Jimbo, I basically spent the entire weekend with them. They're amazing guys. Refused to let me buy a drink. Wouldn't take my drinks. Nothing. Tried to ditch you. They tried to ditch me. I, they didn't yell when I came and found them. It was just, it was fantastic. Um, obviously the face hammer guys were amazing talking to Les and Byron and Russ and just Terry. It was fantastic. They were all so open, willing to talk with everybody, talk about their armies, talk about the gaming, talk about the podcast, anything you could want to rolling bad guys showed up with Elric and, uh, James. And then we had guys from frontline gaming show up with, you know, Andrew Saver was there. And then Scott Reed who runs LVO. It was just, it was as Aaron, Eric was saying, it's such a confluence of people. How Brent do you Portable remember all Ohio. those names? I don't remember your guys' names. So actually, that's one of my funny stories. I wasn't going to use test. reference. It. So Andy Avery is a player from the uh, the Britain, and he doesn't play OS right now, but he got talked into it this weekend. And he literally just kept asking me over and over. Like, Are you British? And I was like, no. And it's like, you wish how do so. you know all this stuff? And I was like, well, I just follow Twitter. I did, you know, I follow and uh, Warp Tunnel. No, come on. Admit that you're like a raging anglophile like i am a raging anglophile Absolutely. however that that accent was right. like a huge insult and they're not gonna want to hang out with you anymore <laughs> i don't know they i did it all the time when i was talking to them i'm sure uh, you but, did uh warp tunneler uh on twitter was there as well andy and um and it's a funny story because he's like i was like who are you and he's like i'm introducing myself i'm paul pj shard on twitter he's like i'm andy and i was like well, what's your name you know on twitter and he's like yeah and he's like what's your name he's like it's a war war and i'm like oh you're warp tunneler and he was like how did you know that? And Mitzi's like, he's a Twitter stalker. And I'm like, yeah. That's <laughs> Back. Uh, spade is spade. So, well, I think, I think everybody was in agreement that it would have been more useful for people to just put their Twitter handles on yeah, their absolutely. Tags, rather than yeah. introducing people by their names. But yeah. that's not way Akon does it. So no. uh, I do have two quick moments. I broke it down to two from a four because I already shared the other two. Uh, one of them was I was playing a game. I He's getting like, around was your 75. question, Aaron. Oh, no, I'm, I, I'm doing I'm something else now. I left. I'm gone. <laughs> uh, so I was on table 75, uh, and uh, one of the Ballard boys, I believe, uh, was playing on the table next to me, and I think his mom was there. Um, and he was playing Carriage on Overlords, and I was playing Carriage on Overlords, but with my conversions for the uh, Grot Bag Scuttlers. And he, um, his mom looks at my army and looks at her son's army and tells her son, I, this isn't the same army that you're playing. And the son's like, no, mom, it's it's the same models. He just converted them, so they look different. She looks at my army again. Parents just looks don't at understand. His army, and she Thanks was like, no, print. it's not the same army. It's a completely different army. And the son's like, no, mom, he just he changed them so much that you don't recognize them. And she looks back at the army and she's like, looks at her son, I don't believe you. And that was just such a gratifying moment that like somebody could walk in and look at my army and be like, no, it's been converted to the point where you don't even recognize it's the same force. Paul Wagner Which, fooled somebody's mom. Exactly. I fooled somebody's mom. It was awesome. Hi, mom. Uh, uh, just also a big shout out to my opponents. All five of them said that they just had an amazing time. Uh, really appreciated playing a game against me. Um, well, well, kind of a humble brag there. <laughs> that well, but it leads up to the second story, which really made the weekend for me. Mitzi and Jimbo were awesome. Face Hammer guys were awesome. Everybody was awesome. I already said uh, that. Keep going. I did. I'm just recapping, making sure everybody gets covered. Uh, I was walking in the hallway, and a player that played me last year came up to me and was just so. He was like, "You know what? I've been telling stories about our game. I had such an amazing time. Like I've been telling stories for a year." And I was like, "Wow, I'm blown away that you like came and found me and told me about that." Right. That was awesome. And then another player, uh, Jason Vargas, who plays with Herner, uh, he was just sitting down with his kids and took the time to like tell me that, you know, that game we played four years ago. I still talk to people about that game. It was so good. I had such an amazing time. It was such a great game. Did you, and, did you lie to those guys, too, and tell them that you also tell stories about those games? Like, that's the I, only do. Thing to do. I, I did. I did. Totally. Uh, <laughs> and um, this year at Acon, last year at Acon, I was really lucky, really fortunate, won a ton of awards, won a ton of like just like really special recognition. Uh, this year I didn't win any of that, but I tell you, those two people coming up to me and telling me about how much they enjoyed our games and even years after, like 
It's like, I don't care what I win, right? Like I've already won. Like this is just such an amazing experience. And that's an experience the community can give you even when you lose all five games and you win no games, right? Like you can be walking around having the worst dice, worst tournament performance, and people like that can really just make your weekend. And everyone that I met didn't care to have a conversation about this terrible thing or this bad thing. All they wanted to do was just hang out, talk Warhammer, and have a great time. And man, when you're in a venue with over 250 AOS players whose entire goal is just to hang out with all the other awesome AOS players that you're with, it's impossible to have a bad time. So it was just absolutely amazing. I thought last year was going to be the peak. This year was even better. I mean, and including GW employees. What what was different about that last year? Last year from this year? Yeah. Uh, Well, I missed Ben Johnson from last year. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. I see. I'm sorry. I didn't see the loaded answer here going on. My apologies. (laughs) I was asking a question. It's a loaded question. Come on. (laughs) Um, and Paul, I just want you. I just want you to know that that game that I talked, the Merry Man game in like 2014 that we played, it was fine. I guess I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's, it was there's a balance there. That's, I don't that's think we've ever played. So I... <laughs> no, no, he's never played. Never you played play West? Never played. No. <laughs> oh no. man, but, yeah. I'll agree. I, I, uh, you know, it's, you know, when we go to Havoc, when we go to the other places, there's always great players and, and saw some of those friends there as well. And I had a great game. I had a couple of Jacobs that I played in round one and round three from the, the Nashville contingent. That wasn't their name. Right. Like, Jacob is a term we use around here for like people who are <laughs> from Nashville. A couple of Jacobs. <laughs> A uh, real, real Jacob I was playing over there on the table. Yeah. <laughs> Play that uh, David Jacob guy. Yeah, so uh, that was that was cool. Um, David Griffin and the Nashville uh, crew just also a really fun. Kale Thompson, guy. probably. Uh, I don't didn't know that have, I had met Kale. Didn't he have a theme song? Uh, so he, so he played a he created a theme song for everybody that he was matched up against, or found a theme song. He didn't make the song. <laughs> he he found it on a playlist. <laughs> he bought the song. And so he played uh, Thriller every time I was uh, setting up a unit, nice. or it was my turn. And so then, uh, and then it, we had to we had to get into dancing, and uh, so we had a lot of fun. That was the first game, first day. Um, it was fun. And then uh, Domus was one of my opponents. Who? Uh, Domus, uh, James Hyde. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, don't don't Gloria. don't tell me his name. Like I don't want to know what his real name is. At oh, you got three names. Dude has three names. Um, I played uh, a gentleman from Toronto named Mile who had uh, Zifflin, and I confounded him with my ambush. It was the only he tabled. He cleared every model except one of mine. But you know, I, I scored you know, more points. Second T in Toronto. Continue. Toronto. <laughs> Toronto. Um, and then uh, I played uh, uh, Matthew Surgeon, who was I mentioned was in Madison some time ago, and then oh, yeah. So yeah, a lot of good games though, and and uh, where I was worried about not you know getting through games fast enough and long deployment, uh, managed to hit round five for I think four of the games and round four for one of the games. So that's, that's actually really good. Yeah. So I knew the I didn't forget didn't forget any rules. And there was a lot good. of rules in the Legion of. Uh, Legion of Blood, all I playing. Yeah, whatever it was I was playing. Uh, Legion of Nat. Um, so, it, yeah, I felt pretty good about it. I ended up 28th out of 164. I submarined the heck out of that thing. I for... submarined, but then I just kept diving. I didn't come <laughs> up for air. <laughs> that's, that's called uh, stoning. Journey to the center of the earth. Is that what Paul was doing? That's exactly right. I made it there. It was fantastic. <laughs> What's the name of the? Is that the Nautilus that went down uh, to the center of the Earth? Mm, or is that's that twenty thousand leagues? Leagues under the sea. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Going back next amazing. year, Paul. Oh, absolutely! Everybody's talking to people about it. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And uh, by the way, and uh, Davey and Aaron also going next year. You heard it here from everybody. Uh, I'm I'm busy that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what big that is. Come I gotta on. I gotta wash my hair. Come on. 
Oof. There is a Shades Fire Grand Clash as well, which was amazing, run by Pete Foley and Dave from the rules team, and then James as well. Like another big shout out to the community team and the rules writers and everybody that came over from GW. Right, like yeah. I think a lot of this community that we have, a lot of it is from them coming over last year and showing us that they're just normal gamers like we are. Right, they're writing the rules, they're playing the games, but um, I wouldn't especially... call you a normal gamer. But anyways, yeah. continue. Like you're right, you're right. Uh, Duncan especially was teaching something like 17 painting classes over the weekend for oh, wow. like an hour and a half each time. He was just the only person I've ever seen where they just looked at his schedule and said, "You're this is your room. You get this room the whole weekend." because nobody else is going to have time to be in there because you are just being so intensely amazing the whole time. Um, so, yeah, it was it was just fantastic. Um, Warhammer TV Dan, P. Foley, like so many people that like took the time to have conversations, Adam Hall. It, it like It's one thing to talk to people that are gamers that are really having their time to be able to walk around, have some time off. But when people are literally on the stream the whole time, have like maybe... 20 minutes to talk and are willing to have a 10 minute conversation with you. That's, that's pretty amazing and an awesome time. And I think that really helped uh, the atmosphere to begin with. So. All right. Let's, uh, let's spend the year getting excited for next year and uh, any events in between. All right. What should we do now? Uh, I don't know. Are we done? Is I'm real done, sleepy. Right? Yeah, I think was... I might hit the hay. Or the wrap, I think. you might go to eternal slumber, huh? No, man. What? That's I, I, morbid. I'm dying to. Morbid. <laughs> oh, Davey's like, playing. I think okay. it's more undying. Undying. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, uncover the undying king. All right. Under unearth the, the undying king. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the bit now. Do it. Since the dark days of the Great Awakening. The scattered remnants of humanity have clung to a bleak existence, surviving howsoever they can, no matter what the cost. Tamra, a voivode of the Rectus clans, fights one last desperate battle for the survival of her tribe, the Drac. Now her people face the most relentless enemy ever, the lumbering minions of the Plague God. Where is their lord Nagash, the undying king, when his people need him most? As the gods and their servants vie for power in the mortal realms, Tamra is drawn into a deadly game between life and death as beings long thought gone start to exert their powers once again. Spooky scary. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is spoiler free time. Spoiler free! If, if you haven't read the book yet, you can listen to this part, get a little sense of it. We'll give you our, our kind of uh, uh, feelings on it overall. Yeah. Then we'll let you know before we get into the spoilers so you can pause, go read it, finish it up, and then just, start. just real yeah, quick, like, just thumb right through it. I'll be like, Scott Reed, stop right now. Come back and like, you know, when you finish the book. Be sure. awesome. Like 20, 30 minutes probably. Yeah. So when does this take place? <laughs> um, okay, last I checked, we came to an agreement. I th I'm fairly certain it's the age of chaos, right? Yeah. I think what? so. Smack dab wow. in that age of chaos. And uh, I, for those who I, I oh, feel like ahead. it may be relatively early in the age of chaos. Like, I think so. Like, uh, you know, the chaos arriving and... I don't know, like that. You, you can place it where it, they are not yet triumphant. They're they're kind of storming through the realm. But sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. So just for those of us who aren't completely with the picture, this is a historical fantasy <laughs> novel. Is that right? Yeah, right? very. We we met realm of myth. We've been the age of myth and et cetera. But this is going back in time. Is it's that basically right? a history book. Yeah, they study this in uh in uh, the age of Sigmar like high schools. Excels is high. Excels is high. It. coming out on warhammer tv uh, get ready um <laughs> and so i get so i think this is maybe one of the only if not the only story that we got like in the age of chaos i guess maybe it was pantheon chaos or myth whatever at any rate it's one of the only ones um so it's it's something that's oft talked about um especially in the age of sigmar sort of looking backwards like sigmar is very much the reaction to the age of chaos and so it's nice to actually get a glimpse get a sense of you know, a small picture, but what was going on back there? Um, mm -hmm. it, is this comparable to like the horse heresy sort of thing? I never read any of the 40k stuff, but like, I based, don't on, based on reading the horse heresy, at least the couple, first couple of books, this is not quite comparable. Okay. Um, horse heresy seems well, to be more titans striding the world mm -hmm. and causing this whole, like, it was pre civil war, post civil war. Gotcha, right? gotcha. 
So Age of Chaos is more of like unspoiled Eden moving onward. So it's not that transition period. To me, it seems to be centered into one of the ages. Okay. So um, it's, it's so, historical context at the very least. Oh. Yeah. It, in a broadly very narrative sense, it's not quite a, quite set as the same setting. Sure, sure. And uh, this particular, like, it, they reference this this event prior to this novel is this uh battle of the black skies so um whether it's the age of myth or like one of the you know the thresholds between myth and chaos is this battle that occurred between chaos in and the undead in 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 shyish and basically it's where uh, nagash got his face stomped in maybe even literally like i think they got him in the face um, yeah literally yeah, 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 yeah. In Battle Tome Ever Chosen, I think. Sure, uh, quite possibly. And I think they talk a little bit about it in Legion, Legions of Nagash as well. But point is, is we're seeing the, the ramifications of that. We're seeing the effects of that transition, you know, that crossover from Age of Myth to the Age of Chaos. And sort of it sets the stage of uh, the setting of Shyish um, well, in this age. One of the big mythos in the Rumgate Wars, in um, the you know, Age of Myth, is the Pantheon. And we've we keep hearing the story over and over of you know the pantheon being everybody against chaos, and that Nagash betrayed the pantheon, letting chaos in, which broke things. And then uh, Sigmar gets upset, chases Nagash all over, ends up losing Gamaraz and retreating back to Azir. Um, and then this it seems like this was this is taking place after the first butt whooping by. Archaon, right? Sure, yeah. So he's somehow maybe right after that betrayal, um, uh, we get Archaon kicking Nagash's butt, and Nagash is in a weakened state. Too true. Uh, yeah. Flash dead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that that's that's when. Let's do. You want to talk about where? Which I think we've already alluded to. Um, we're we're predominantly dealing in Shyish, and by predominantly, I mean exclusively. Oh, um, Shyish, your mouth. Yeah, you you know it, son. Um, so, uh, <laughs> as we all know, the realms are almost infinite. But specifically, when we're dealing in the realm of death, I think the story is going to take place mostly in the sort of the northern wastes part of this realm. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for the most part, it's not specifically important. However, it's worth mentioning because this area is relatively remote. Like, it's not the central hub of any sort of civilization, of which there are many in the, the realm of death. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that this we're, we're sort of not even on the outskirts, but we're in the wilderness out there. Um, and it, that plays a little bit into the, the story quite a bit. Uh, anything else you guys want to talk about? Realm of death, pretty pretty standard. Bunch of dead people. Yeah, we're... Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, as I say, we're kind of in the ruins of uh, a great yeah. kingdom. True. Yeah. Um, it was once unified, um, but that uh, in the age of, I'm assuming in the age of myth, uh, while Nagash, we also hear from the, you know, from the malign importance um, stories and some of the background, uh, we hear Nagash uh, going through Shyish, um, consuming other gods, other gods of death. Uh, we know that Sh you know, and so um, during some of this conquering of Shyish that Nagash is doing, um, he punishes this this group of of kings, or what is it? The uh, and and so once this one great kingdom becomes scattered, yeah. And I'd the say ruins. that's kind of the, the setting. There's lots of, of ruins. There's uh, uh, instead of being a great civilization it's a lot of barbarian tribes um and that's kind of it's it's an interesting and they they have an interesting relationship with the undead true true that's a, a good distinction like we're not out in the wilderness per se but rather in the ruins of something that was once great and that kind of uh, informs us a little bit about uh how nagash rules this realm which i reckon we'll, we'll talk about um as well, well i think there's an interesting parallel too and we, we were talking about um in the beginning, we hear a lot of the saying, um, Shyish is Nagash and Nagash is Shyish, or we are Nagash and Nagash is us. Um, and we're set in a space where the body has been torn asunder and scattered yeah. in the ruins. Um, and so it's, so this the Drac, the, the, this people, are kind of a representation of, of where Nagash is at the moment. True, true. Hey, uh, speaking of people, let's 
let's talk about the who's of who? this. Yeah, who? Um, it, who? We would probably be in trouble if we didn't talk about Nagash first. Like we, yeah, it wouldn't look good if we didn't bring him up. So he might uh, come and take care of us. Yeah, true, true. Um, so Nagash, although omnipresent throughout this book, um, is by no means a character that we get a, a lot of perspective from per se. But it, it, we'd be remiss if we didn't we didn't talk about him. So we talked about how we got into the state that he's in post uh, the Battle of. Whoa. Black skies, something black skies. Black skies. Black skies. Yeah, burning skies is where Gal Moraz is lost, and black skies is where Nagash gets his dome crushed. Man, imagine being like a mortal realms like Denizen, looking up at the sky constantly, being like, "What the hell is going on?" You know what I would avoid in the future? What Ninja would you do? battle with the word skies in it. Sure. Yeah. Avoid gonna... the next battle, anything with skies. It's not going to turn out well for you. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who mentioned the first person who mentions calling it something skies. Out. He'll he'll he's done. He's done. Huge, huge smote. But uh, Nagash, he, he's he's been beaten. Got that butt kicked. Um, he's he's a little broken. Um, so much so that like that his Mortrox had to, Mortrox had to save him. Um, he's not at full strength, both physically and mentally. Like he's not even all there at this point. Um, yeah. But uh, we know that he's he's basically trying to gather himself back together. Um, he, yeah. He's he's on the mend. Hopefully. Um, that's the. You know, I had a cold a couple of weeks ago. I ex- know exactly what he feels like. Sure, same exact thing. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's hopefully either. I mean, like, he's kind of a bad guy. I don't know if I'm hopefully going to, you know, you you shut your mouth. You, know. you shut your dirty mouth right yeah, now. I'm just That's saying. It. I'm just saying. Interesting conversation to have later. I I, I might object to that unnecessarily. Um, but with, with Nagash, <laughs> we also get his 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 classic, his 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 lieutenants. I don't know what you call them. His Mortarks, obviously, is Mortarks. what they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you call them. I mean, it's like they don't even have a name. What would I even use to describe them? Um, if so only the, somebody made up a name. His, sure. org, awesome. his org chart is just question mark above them. Sure. Uh, <laughs> let's just call them Mortarks for the sake of... Uh, good. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Less Tarks. Um, because we're dealing... Uh, in, in the story, we're also going to get a little bit of Neferata. We're going to get a little of, of Arcan as well. Um, I can so, hardly believe that you forgot Mortark. Uh, I can hardly believe it. Fair enough. Um but the, the idea is, is there, these two are sort of his representatives for this story. Um, given that this God is sort of so above quote unquote, the story that we're dealing with, um, he needs to have his, you know, representatives on, you know, boots on the ground sort of, sort of thing. And so these two characters sort of are not necessarily standing in for him, but are his reps, um, to sort of, uh, intercede on behalf of the plot for, uh, for Nagash, especially considering he's not necessarily all there. Um, so they're, they're doing what, doing what they can to protect Nagash and they're doing what they can to protect the realm without necessarily getting any, I keep saying necessarily, uh, without getting any uh, reliable help from them. Um, so they are working as, as autonom- autonomously as one can uh, when you're in the service of a broken God. To, to add a little more detail to that, and I, th- I think this is okay in the, in the, in the non-spoiler space. True. Sure. Do we want to say where Nagash is and about those gates, or is that something we wait till the spoiler? Uh, I was thinking hold off. I was thinking of holding off, but you do you, okay. man. Whatever you think. Uh, no, I think we can hold off to us. keep listening if you'd like. Oh, oh yeah, man, Let's this is like a, this is a lost cliffhanger. Yeah. Cliffhanger. Let's just say it's a really interesting relationship that goes on. And, like he's a really fascinating character, especially for uh, what's going on in him right now. So I I, I really enjoyed it. Too true. And like, I didn't read Lord of Un- Undeath or any of that other stuff. So I don't know how much we dive into like Neferata or Arcan. I guess we see a little bit of Arcan in like the audio dramas, but um, they're in this book enough that you you get a pretty good sense of them if you've never read anything else of, about them. Um, uh, Absolutely. What we know about Arcan is he's, he's loyal through and through. He's Nagash's right hand, right hand man. Um, and because of that he's all the more important because with Nagash sort of out of commission to, to some extent, um, folks are going to look to Arcan as sort of an authority authority figure. And additionally, sort of maybe on the other side of that same coin, uh, Neferata also is duty bound to serve Nagash, but she has a little bit of a independent streak running through her. I mean, if you know anything about Neferata, you know, she's a, she's a schemer, she's a planner. Um, and that, that comes through in this, this book as well. Um, you better believe that she's got, she's got ulterior motives regardless of, you know, who she serves. I think yeah, and if, if you definitely want to read this book, um, and or keep listening, 
if you want to get more about kind of, yeah, what we're talking about is like who these characters are and what their relationship is to Nagash and how in, intrinsic they are. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. I thought, I found that to be super interesting about those characters. Agreed. Um, so those are sort of the major players that you guys know and love. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, folk that you, a uh, person you, you may or may not have come across depending on the books that you've read before, but we've, we've covered a, a certain a little book called the spear of shadows. Oh gosh. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's a call back to that book though. I don't know which one was written first. Actually, I think this one, call this one, forward even. Call forward, yeah, no, I think this one was written first. <laughs> um, we, get a, we get a glimpse of uh, the, the vampire known as edema, which, which, uh, featured relatively heavily in in that book so this is a a, a vampire i don't know if she has like a, a unit designation but she's, she's under a, the, she's a castellan and a blood knight you know? gotcha okay so she's under the under the employ or I don't know, under the control of, of neferata so uh we saw her working a little bit more independently in that other other novel but in this book she's she's um sort of a i don't know a handmaiden to uh neferata so she's she's um working very closely with her uh, in this setting, and, and we, we see a fair bit of her as well. Um, she's still just as uh, sassy as ever. Um, oh she's got goodness. that, yeah, she's got that too. Um, but she, she's she's back as well. Yep, absolutely. All right, so that's a that's a couple of the the old returning characters. As you might expect, we got a few new new characters as well. Um, we can talk about I don't know. You'd probably call her the main protagonist. We can talk about Tamra, then Drac. Yep, uh, who's a uh, new character. In the realm of death, so you better believe she's dead. Yeah, she's totally dead. Just kidding, she's totally alive. What? Ah, oh crap! Sense. Totally. That, that, don't, that, that don't make any sense. Um, she's a uh, she's a an alive person. I don't know, a human being in, well, the, in the realm of death. Per, yeah, she's more of a free people. Right? Yeah, she's well, not undead. She's a free people. No. And, she's, and, a, and, she's a necromancer. Sure, necromancer. So I think wow. she probably would show up in the death, the uh, Grand Alliance. Um, <laughs> But she is sort of I mean, all. She, she could be a beast wizard of death. That's true. You can't just rule that out. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Um, but she's a, a leader of her yep. people, which are, I mean, for the most part, um, alive, right? So, like, as you might expect, or maybe you don't expect it, but there are there are plenty of non undead uh, residents of the, of the realm of death, and she's an example of that. So she's she's in charge of this clan um, of of human beings that. that uh, revere the dead, you know, respect the dead. I don't want to say, say worship the dead, but work real closely with the dead. It'd probably be hard not to in the realm of death. I mean, they, and they, they are, they, I mean, it's uh, in a lot of cultures, there's a lot of um, uh, ancestral um, worship. Wor yeah. And again, I don't know if worship is the word, but, but communing. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's that, Davy? Veneration. Yep. Yep. So, and and you know respect for you know they do a lot of preparation with the dead, um, and they and they work side by side with the dead, yeah. um, which was uh, cool. Kind of just right out the outset, um, seeing how uh, Tamra and her brother, who is dead, uh, work alongside each other at, at the at the outset. Sure, which one's going to show? Hand in hand or hand in skeleton hand? Bone man man. Mandibles? Yeah, sure. And no. Spooky metacarpals. <laughs> yeah. Medi hand and metacarpals. I mean, I just want David to confirm it. David, confirm. That'll David work. Confirm. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. Um, so, uh, it, it, as you'll find out as we talk more about this book, it, it really does focus on the interplay between the living and the dead in this in this realm. And I think it's a, a big focus of this book and shows she's sort of the focal point of that, where we can sort of uh, put ourselves in, in the shoes of somebody who would be living in uh, the realm of death. Shaish. Um, so keep oh, yours up. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's two. Um, and so I think we've, that's, I mean, there's quite a few characters on the, on the death side for the most part. That's, that's the, the most important ones. Uh, shall we transition to what some might consider the antagonist of the story? Ooh, gross. Yes. I know, real. real you, I just got goosebumps thinking about it. Um, guys, we're reading a we're reading a Reynolds book. Who do you think the the antagonists are going to be? Spider Man. Spider Man. Spider -Man. Spider -Man. That's do not. Why would you even? That doesn't. Well, that's too different. It's the opposite. Yeah. It's, oh crap! <laughs> I, I was hoping for a Spider Fang book. 
<laughs> look, spoiler alert, look elsewhere. No spiders in this one. Um, uh, it's the return of the order. Shadows. Spear of Shadows has uh, spiders. Spear of Shadows. That's like 100% better because it's got spiders in it. And Battle no, Archeon. No, no, really. Yeah, fair enough. Um, guys, it's the Order of the Fly, our favorite. Oh, uh, these favorites. guys are awesome. Everybody loves that Order of the Fly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Lady Fest this. Uh, no. Drinking goopy chalices and stuff. So uh, in this book, we follow uh, a, a a gentleman known as the Blight Master Wolgus, and he's got a knight under under him that's uh, Sir Fester Festerbite. That yep. sounds right. Yeah. Um, and so Wolgus is a particularly effective uh, tactician. I um, mean, he's and he's got his knight under him, who I mentioned is probably pretty good at tactics as well. Um, and uh, they're there. Your your classic Order of the Fly. Uh, individuals i think i think wolgus is maybe a little bit known for his his tactics he's, he's very cerebral in his his uh his fighting but uh for the most part i mean it, it's it's the order of the fly that you know and love honor bound um loving that lady of the what is her name Kinker. uh lady of the Flybone chalice sure also I, i'll accept all of those answers um Ding ding, um, so they're they're new, but based off what we know so far about the Order of the Fly, like I said, they're honor bound. They like drinking from those chalices, and they're probably super super contagious. Like you you have... If we could give a quick like two sentence summary to what the Order of the Fly is, do you think? Oh, yeah, for folks who don't know, I thought he just did. <laughs> well, but I mean from the background, right? Like from how they act. So, all right, I'll give it. Since, uh, all right, Nurgle uh, Bretts. Go. If if you mix Bretonians with Nurgle. You keep the honor, but you discard the cleanliness. You get the order of the fly. Yeah, sure, true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you you can really picture. Um, I mean, the the Wargus is very much, you know, a a you know knight of uh, you know or a, a general type, um, super kind to his to the those underneath him, even affectionate in his leadership. Yeah, you know. There's a lot of respect that he, you know, earns from them. So it's unlike what you might see for definitely from like a corn leader who just beats his the subservience, you know, uh, upside the head or whatever. Um, but yeah, Davy, what did you think of? Do you have any other way to describe these guys? No, I like how Paul summed it up. Uh, it's been it's been what I've said this a lot of times, but it's been what Josh Reynolds I think does better than anyone else. Mm. That I've read in Black Black Library is uh, is make chaos characters that are somehow at least partially relatable, you know, uh, and that makes them engaging instead of just being like, oh, like here's you know this finger waggling villain who can't wait to destroy the world. Like they they have some kind of mustache twirling. Is that what you're going for, Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah see. You know. Uh, it's someone that's interesting to read about and just be like, okay, well, like this is a guy who's going to get kicked in the nards at some point. Cause he's a bad guy. Like you're, you can, you can actually on some level root for root for these guys. Cause they have motivations that you can understand or identify with to some extent. So. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, um, how was it a, what is the um, Herald uh, of Nurgle that, that features in this as well, that becomes kind of just within their camp, a little bit of a antagonist to him. You know, whereas he's the protagonist of the Nurgle story, uh, you know, this uh, Gorum becomes the the antagonist of of the, and and that's what, I mean that's the other kind of depth and what we the interesting thing about chaos and some of these other um, forces is how they sometimes they are tripping over themselves, right? Um, they're their own undoing, um, and uh, so seeing how these these forces kind of in fight and uh, undermine each other. And, and that's a, a fun part of that, that part of the story. Um, yeah. Agreed. Um, so I think we covered the, the moving pieces. We, co- we covered the pawns of, of this story. I guess we could talk about what, what they're up to. What's the, what's the, what's the premise, um, which we don't know a lot about age of chaos, but I feel like this is pretty typical of what was going on is that we got a realm, we got a realm right from the taking Nagash is sort of on the back foot. Um, Chaos has got its eye on it, Nurgle specifically, because he's sort of a life and death kind of guy, um, and he's he's looking to looking to take it over. Um, this branch of the Order of the Fly that we've been talking about has been sent by Nurgle uh, to wipe out sort of this this northern clans, this northern area. We know that there's plenty of folks up there that need need tending to. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a, that's a garden 
reference right there. So, um, yeah, we're going to – Wait till you get a load of me. Okay, well, you're, I'm going to mute you right now. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, they specifically, they're looking to save them from the stagnation of death, right? Yeah, like, I was just going to say, yeah. All stagnation, um, like, you know, which is, which is cool. You know, Nurgle's about uh, this cycle, um, but on a different level than, you know, than we're, than we like In to think. In favor of. of. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, they, they're on a crusade. Like, they, that's what they call it. They're on this crusade to liberate. Uh, liberate the realm from the gashes. Uh, uh, sterile, like, um, I don't know, stasis that he's trying to put in the stasis of death. Sure, yeah. Uh, there's no cycle if everything's just in a, in a flat sort of right. line. Um, it's true. So they, they're sending this, this I don't know, retinue, uh, vanguard, I don't know, some group of the, the order of the fly out there sort of uh, I would, uh, bolstered I would with a crusade. Yeah. A crusade, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Crusade, right? Sure, sure. Um, bolstered by forces from you know the the demons of Nurgle as well. So it's not just our our mortal rock bringers, but they've got they've got a uh, an alliance with the Nurgle demons as as well. Um, so it, it's sort of an impressive force to go out and weed out what some might think is just a ragtag bunch of barbarians out there. Um, but they're 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 sent on a mission and they're they're to take care of business. Um, so whether it was intentional or not, we're, we're sort of thrust into this story um, with Tamra and her, her range of uh, death allies who are there to sort of stop them, whether intentionally or not, or um, it's sort of out of necessity to sort of save their, you know, way of life or what have you. Uh, Nurgle comes and knocking, you got to stand up to him. And there's, and uh, that's the that's the main drive of the story. And then there's just a couple of you know it wouldn't be intrigue without a couple of plot twists. Oh, yeah. and, uh, you know some some ulterior motives from from some of our main characters. True, true. Um, when you get the Mortarks involved, what plans uh, are you the pawn of? And and when the, the hero when a when a demon of uh, greater demon of Zinch gets involved, uh, what are they not telling you? Nurgle, but yeah, you're right. Nurgle, sorry, Nurgle. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what are you talking about our no, Iron Skies again? What's going on? No, it's for Zinch. Like it could maybe be another, there, right? Maybe there's a Zinch guy involved. You don't know. Read the book. <laughs> That's true. Read the book. Um so we'll 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 stop with our spoiler free stuff right there. Uh we'll we'll get into spoilers in a sec, but for those folks who, who don't know if they should read it, let's let's chat about whether or not we recommend it. Let me go real go first just real quick. Um I recommend it. I think it's an awesome book. Uh it, it, first, of all, first of all, it's a very manageable read. It's not too long. I think he hits his story points that he needs to in a very uh, concise and consistent manner. Um, it kept me, it was a real page turner because there was always something going on, which I'm real into. Um, it's a great book for anybody who plays Undead. We don't get a lot of Undead perspective, especially we don't get a lot of sympathetic Undead perspective. I feel like a lot of the, uh, you know, the skeletons and the zombies are often like nameless, faceless uh, enemies that need to be taken care of, like fodder that needs to be waded through, whereas this is a completely new perspective, um, which I'm all about. Uh, and I think because of that, I was real, real drawn into it from a guy who doesn't give, doesn't care about basically the death quartet uh, whatsoever. I, I started rooting for death, which I never thought I would have. Um, it's the classic, like uh, Davey alluded to before, uh, getting the Nurgle perspective that makes you still sort of want to root for them too, or at least for some of them. Um, I love that, love that order of the fly. And it's, uh, delivers in the same way that the other sort of order of the fly uh, scenes that we've seen in the past, sort of the same thing. Um, I'm all about it. Someone go next. David, what do you think? Recommend it. Um, I think I can say that it was my uh, favorite novel length Age of Sigmar piece of fiction so far. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, it's the one that it's the one that I uh, turned the pages most readily on. You know, I never, you know, I was like excited to come back to. Sometimes it's a little bit like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what's going on, but it's not, it's not grabbing me. Um, but uh, Play Garden was good. This was great. So um, Josh Reynolds continue to find his form with uh, uh, Age of Sigmar fiction. So, uh, some of the reasons on that we'll get into, but uh, I, I thought. Uh, the characters were well written. We had character development, which is not something that we always get in this kind of thing. Like sometimes it's just enough to say, "Hey, I wrote a book and it's set in the Age of Sigmar, and you're going to read it because of that." But here, they did some character development, relatable characters on both sides. So it was never like, "Oh man, you know." Now here's the boring part where they talk about the 
you know, this group of people who I don't care about. Like they, he, he did a good job of uh, making everybody interesting and relatable. So, uh, yep, highly recommend. How about you, Paul? Uh, I recommend the book. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it wasn't my favorite, um, but that's just because I'm not a huge fan of Nurgle or Death in general. Um, but for that being said, I definitely enjoyed reading the book. I definitely enjoyed the storyline and felt like, as Davey was saying, it progressed re- relatively well. Uh, there was a lot of interesting back and forth between the characters. There was a lot of interesting back and forth uh, just between the actual setting itself. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, who would I recommend it to? I'd probably recommend it to, obviously, anybody that wants to read about Nurgle. Is really cool. We've got Myrtle, Mortals, and then you've also got the demons going on here. Um, I would obviously recommend it to anybody that's uh, a fan of death. Um, it is a sympathetic death voice, and that's amazing. Um, I would also add that if you're a fan of free peoples, and especially how free peoples can change based on what realm you are in, this is a really good book to read, to read about how free peoples act in the realm of death. I thought that was a really cool, interesting new approach uh, to how that worked out. So, yeah. Thumbs up. I also super duper recommend this book, primarily for those uh, who who love death. I mean, yeah, we've been getting a lot of great stories from Malign Portance on kind of how some of death uh, interacts with the world. Um, I I still don't think these are free people. Uh, They're certainly humans. They're mortals. uh, But they don't they don't worship stigma. They don't worship those things. This is, um, I love the take on, on Tamara, her people and how they relate to and work with the dead. And, and there's even a, a part where it talks about, um, kind of male, male necromancy versus female necromancy. This idea of, of, of between forcing the dead to serve you and, and urging them into, um, kind of ser- into working with you. Um, and so there's, you know, that doesn't necessarily have to be gender lines, but I'm just thinking about different ways that a necromancer can rely, re- enact, uh, interact with the dead, how the, how the different kind of motives of the dead uh, can come together. And, and we, have, we have skeletons and zombies and uh, flesh eaters and night haunts and Mortarks and death mages and everybody's represented here, but in such a way that it ties together and it, and it and it just the way they all kind of work together like you could build you could build a uh, undiv- you know an, an undead alliance army based in this book and and the theme would be amazing um so i definitely loved uh, the way uh, Josh Reynolds brought that together um and then there's a ton of just these cool moments uh some of which make tomb kings uh players raise their fists and go why did you take them away so i'll just say that as well <laughs> anyway, uh, why don't we? Last warning. Scott Reed, stop now. Go read we're, the book. We're heading into spoilers. Five, four, three, two, one. Darth Vader's Luke's dead. Oh, <laughs> my God. How, could you? how could you? All right, so we want we talked about a little bit about see how do we want to approach this when we decided we're going to break this story down into three parts. We're going to talk a little bit about the first, uh, and, and maybe instead of like talking about all three parts, we'll just say here, part one is our where we immediately open the book. The Order of the Fly is bearing down, is, is coming towards uh, the, the kind of fort, fortification of the, of the drac, um, and are kind of uh, knocking at the door. Uh, that's a polite way to put that. Yes, yes, Nurgle, it is. Nurgle does not knock. Um, so what were some of the, you know, in this first opening scene, um, we get introduced to Tamara, we get introduced to Wargus, we get introduced to Gorm, we get introduced to Festerbite, we get introduced to uh, uh, Tamara's brother. Um, what was his who, name? Who has a name? Aaron? <laughs> I wish. That'd be cool if I had a cool <laughs> sister. I know. I'll look it up. Keep going. Um, and and so we get introduced to them, and we've got Nurgle knocking at the door. Um, but kind of the so so what were some of the things that uh, that you guys saw in this first opening kind of setting that really really called to you? 
Well, I think right out the gate, it's grabbed me because I sort of alluded to before uh, the idea of the the living and the dead working so closely together. It was a it was a scene. It was an environment. It was a you know setting, I guess that I haven't personally. I don't remember ever being sort of exposed to. Um, a lot of times when you deal with death, you uh, get a lot of uh, folks who are in control and those those you know necromancers or whatever are, are sort of controlling the mindless dead and you know sicking them after after whoever their enemies are this was much more uh, interplay between the living and the dead sort of working eh, i'm not gonna say autonomously but at least hand in hand um to you know fight off so they, they were they were allies as opposed to you know master and, and slave um you see that especially in the interplay between um Tamra and her brother Sarpa, who's some sort of, I don't know, white or what have you, I don't know, but he, he's working, he's got his own thoughts, even in death. Um, and that was, that right then and there, like, grabbed me and really hooked me, um, yeah. pulled me in and, and pointed, or, you know, just highlighted that these are some folks that I was real, real interested in. It's cool from so, an army I, building perspective where you can, you know, instead of your, your white king being mindless, you know, like, oh, like, these guys could have their own motivations. Um <laughs> But also, like, talking about this sort of different approach to what a necromancer is, uh, it, it kind of drove home to me, like, some of the obstacles that these Black Library authors are up against, right? Because, like, um, I'd, uh, I, I might have been the first one to finish it, uh, and then I was... It's not a race, man. No, 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 but I'm saying, so I I read through <laughs> all the ready, so I knew the, I knew the whole book laid out. And then I'm looking at the chat while Paul and Eric are talking to each other about what they've read so far. And they're like, oh, what do you think Tamara is? Is she a necromancer? And Paul's like, well, no, she's not. A, she probably isn't a necromancer. She's wearing armor. I was like, man, like people writing these things like have all these, you know, conventions that people, you know, people in the gaming community have built up by, you know, just by books they've read, read or Dungeons and Dragons and all these things that say like, oh, well, wizards don't have armor, you know, all, all this sort of thing. And so not only are you like, I don't know, you, you have all these conventions that you're working against that are that exist in the Warhammer universe, but on the in the greater fantasy universe. Uh, and so, you know, when people see something that's out of the ordinary, how they react to it uh, could be positive or negative. But uh, you, you take a risk every time you you ditch some of those. And I enjoy it. You know, I, I I love seeing them try something new instead of just following the same route. I think that's one of the things that makes this book great. And that was what grabbed me right off the bat, like you were saying, Aaron. It's like, oh, like here's this White King that. I think it's you know interesting and the brother to somebody and got a relationship with somebody who's living like very very interesting right at the bat I'm like okay you got me I'm, I'm gonna read this sure. yeah uh, same thing for me I it was not revealed at the beginning what Sarpa is right they're just talking about this brother and sister and how they're getting ready to badass is what stuff, he is right and it's only like when you get a couple pages in that it's like oh yeah by the way he's a white king yeah like that reveal to me was just like one of my favorite moments in the book. It's like, oh man, now it's gonna happen, right? Like this is awesome. Where he's he's taking something that's not really canon, and like especially mixing the living and the dead, and like er like Eric alluded to, like it's straight up Tomb Kings, right? Like you keep your soul, you keep your personality, um, but you're undead. But yeah. the crazy thing is like they go through this whole preparation. You know, it's not mummification. But it is preparation. They leave the bones out to be picked clean by the vultures. And then once the bones are picked clean, then they inscribe their runes into them. And then they ask them to be raised, right? Like, yeah. And I would definitely be okay with arguing that this is more of a free peoples than an undead. I definitely get your point of where you're coming from, where it's a necromancer, etc., cetera, uh, raising the dead. But this is such a different way of doing it. When we had yeah, two but, kings but in the free old people, world. But you got to use the term. Free peoples is a very specific faction well, at, the moment, at the moment I know, but we don't have anything else free peoples is a specific faction that worships sigmar but to get back well, to the book no, to get back I'll to the book worship, I, yeah but anyway I, yeah. I, think, I think a great, great way like, like i think a great way to go home the this point that um uh, like they work hand in hand is that your narrator in this segment who's tamra does not think it's important until some like a significant part of the way in to mention that oh yeah my brother's dead right mm -hmm. like i'm yep. fighting alongside my brother like he, he's bringing his troops up to like hold the line and then reveal like bt dubs he's dead you know but <laughs> it, it's not it, it's just it's just how they operate you know it's how they how they roll and so i well i mean and i think it takes i mean like necromancer 
again, we have these tropes that tell us that necromancers are bad people. Tropes, that's the word. <laughs> but in this book, she's a necromancer. She is not a bad person. Right. Um, I, 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 this past uh, Christmas season, I went and saw Coco with my son. And Coco is about um, the the traditions in uh, it's okay. We're in the culture. spoilers area, so just go crazy. <laughs> well, it's, it's not going to spoil Coco for anyone. Uh, How about but wicked. How about wicked? It's about the his, you know the Hispanic culture and the again the veneration of the dead and remembering your ancestors and those that have gone before you. And in the the story of Coco, there's a communing of the, of sorts um, where there's again this relationship is tangible, and I loved. Um, there's this part where you get a contrast between how they've, how, when they are able to take the proper uh, kind of time, they, res- they show the respect for their dead by, you know, the runes, making a plea, arming them, giving them armor and weapons that have been handed down and all those things. There's a moment when, as the, the enemy comes further into the camp, where there's some of her living brothers and sisters and family that have died. And, and she has to make a choice on whether or not to yeah. use them yeah. without yeah. that preparation, without that, that uh, proper uh, prep, you know, preparation, whatever. And, and just kind of jerks them out of, of death to use them to, to, for the purposes of protecting her people and how sick that makes her. Yeah. Um, and again, breaking that, that idea that, that necromancers just disrespect and use the dead uh, to their own will, which is a contrast that we'll see later mm-hmm. um, to, to maybe how other people treat the dead. Yeah. True. Yeah. 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 I think, I think this is it. I think this is like what can make the age of Sigmar uh, narrative and fiction and all that sort of thing compelling is the way they can shed some of these tropes uh, and make some of these old ideas fresh again, by the way they choose to approach them, whether it's in, gameplay dwarves who live in the sky or in the fiction necromancers who are not straight up evil i think aaron's signaling elves who live under the sea yeah that's exactly what i was doing i don't know about them (laughs) we're we're gonna put that save that one for that oh yeah yeah yeah. sorry we're back rewind reverse reverse it's a real great one to hang on to him (laughs) keep it in the back pocket no one coming it sounds like we we really like uh, this death dynamic, uh, yeah. but that's just one this one half of the story. Um, what, what do we what do we find out about Nurgle? Who who are we dealing with on that side? Order of a fly. Too true. Um. So they. I mean. So we talk. We hear about Wargus, and uh, we hear about the the later lady of the whatever the chalice. What what is it again? Paul? Tanker or something something. The uh, uh, Order of the Flybone Chalice, and then the Lady of Cankerwall. Cankerwall, there it is, and and it's, it has absolutely so. Can- Lady of Cankerwall um, came under the service of Nurgle. Um, I am. I. Th- it talks a little bit about her background, but it wasn't maybe something important enough. Did you guys take notes on that, or you remember what? <laughs> we we learned just a little yeah, bit more about her than before. <laughs> um, Okay. We've we've heard a reference in a couple different things in uh, Plague Garden. She's mentioned in Outcast. Yep. She's mentioned. Uh, so she's shaping up to be this figure who you know Josh Reynolds is at in bit by bit. So mm-hmm. she's exist. I have not read um, Maggotkin, so I, I'm sure she pops up somewhere in there. But yeah. it's just kind of cool. Where like we got this player on the field, um, Lady Cankerwall. She's got some yeah. big role. But um, she's got a chalice, which is like Holy Grail, which is like Lady of the Lake, which is yeah. all these things. I mean, they, mm-hmm. the trope or the 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 kind of the Bretonian flair is full force. Like, this isn't just like kind of there. Yeah. Um, you know, like this is heavy uh, in there. Um, these guys yeah. refer to each other like, oh, gentle, gentle fester bite. And, you know, they, they it's all this nightly talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, it's super cool. I, again, it's it's a ton of respect. Stuff. Like, and, and like, like they are choosing to follow each other, and they've chosen to follow Nurgle. This isn't like so. We learned uh, in in Gates of Azir that um, you know the Mara- the uh, the Re- Reavers are forced to eat each other, mm-hmm. eat their their kin, and that as they eat that and as they kill, like corn just drums into their heads, and they become insane with corn's rage. These guys 
are are like have their eyes have been opened to Nurgle's blessing and to what he's going to create, and the, so there's just a totally different vibe from these guys. Um, honorable and respectful of of the circle of life, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it's yeah that they're, they're like I mean they're gentle in their in how they uh, and and I mean it, they're knightly in the way they they communicate with each other. Too true. I just did a search and I don't find nothing about the lady in the Magikin book. Okay. Drop that ball. All right. Whoops. Josh Reynolds didn't write that though. Hmm? <laughs> she didn't write the book. Yeah, that's true. Get on that, Jay. Uh, ag- agreed. I'm trying to think if I have anything else to add. Um, I, I, like we said before, uh, it's real easy to get real sympathetic and, and, and root for these guys as well. It's, it's hard not to, um, especially considering the Bretts are gone. So like, who else are you going to get your fix from, uh, you know, your, your honor and your chivalry. That is the next best thing, I suppose. Um, so here, here's the question. Would you, if you were to make this army, would you make a Bretonian army with Nurgling bits or would you make, are these kind of more Blight King style dudes roaming around? I mean, they're not all mounted on horses, are they? Who are you talking to? I would definitely no. say they're more Blight King, uh, to be honest. They seem to be fully enveloped in this worship of Nurgle to the point where or giving the darkness. gift of despair, right? It's the gift of despair that really defines them. They're giving the gift of despair. They're giving the gift of not having to worry about what's going to come forward because everything's going to be terrible, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's kind of what they're about. They do hate and hope. Yeah. They do yeah, hate hope. The cruelty yep, of false saying, hope, right? Exactly. The cruelty is false hope. And that to me is a straight up Nurgle thing as opposed to a Bretonian thing. If you were going to try and actually model them as they started, I think a Bretonian would absolutely be the way to go. And um, this would be the closest that we've probably gotten to where the order started. But I think because of their complete devotion to Nurgle, if they're being sent on holy crusades to other realms, at this point, they would be fully involved in that whole Blight King aesthetic. I, when I think, when I think of uh, Chris Tomlin's got some awesome conversions where he took, uh, what are the uh, Ever Chosen Knights? The um... Van- Varengard? Varengard. He's got Varengard, but he puts like Blight King bodies on those. Mm-hmm. Mm, they look awesome, and that's that's what I think of when I'm thinking of uh, what these guys look like. Well, yeah, some of them ride like crazy, like deformed yeah. steeds and stuff, right? Which is yeah. exactly like the Varengard, like horses, you know, whatever they're riding. Um, Did we talk about the the Herald of Nurgle and his palanquin yet? Hey, let's talk about him right now. Because that's amazing, where he took four Kurnoth hunters and bent them into a seat for him to sit upon. You have a weird definition of the word amazing. Yeah. And like, yeah. I'm sorry, from a modeling perspective, that sounds like so much fun to actually make. Right? You have a weird it's, definition it's of the word fun. <laughs> horrible, torturous, like terrible, but it, it would be so much fun to make this character from a conversion perspective. I really, really was tempted to make him. Uh, and I might make him still and add it to my Nurgle army because it is such a cool idea. I love that he is so consumed with the realm of life that he was able to take Kurnoff hunters with him, form them into the thing that he rides to invade other realms, and then control them enough to have them invade the other realms with their magic as well. It's such a twisted, like, creative idea. Let's yeah. leave it there. So, like for for the sake of the story, we're dealing with a a herald, right? Who's who's supplementing, or I don't know, maybe he's the major part of the force. I guess I'm not really sure the numbers, but he's supplementing and sort of serving as a foils, not the word, but just a counterpart, I guess, to the Order of the Fly. Order of the Fly, very uh, steep, seeped, steeped in sort of, I guess, maybe human mentality. It's the it's yeah. the the order the the honor and all that jazz but you know demons don't have any of that or at least we've never seen right. any demons that have that so it's sort of the counterpoint go ahead Danny, hit me i see well, you coming well and they've he, this guy's used uh what he knows about the order to manipulate them into going on his crusade like True. it's his ulterior motive he says hey we're gonna liberate the north of shyish uh from the stagnancy of death but actually what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go finish the deal sneak in and you know kill off the almost dead in the gash uh is is this guy's ambition and uh, he has a little bit where he talks about how, oh, like how easy it is to manipulate the the order, and they start to, you know, they start to clue in and think like mm, maybe we're getting used, but you know, uh, so it, it has some cool interplay of the different factions within. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. But uh, any given God's army is not this monolithic thing. It you know yeah, has its own yeah, internal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and we, I mean, when we did 
to, to bring up Zinch in order to justify me saying it earlier. Yeah, no, um, I see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's this sense uh, there where when we were talking about Zinch is that the the body very much like Zinch likes it when his followers like ruin each other's plans. Uh, that's part of what it means to be part of Zinch is to is that, sometimes fail. Is that uh, how they ruin each other's plans with their fingers like that? Yeah, just uh, uh. oh, sure, okay, got like it. a game of joust. <laughs> uh, um, and then, uh, but so, but here, same kind of thing. Like he, you know, he's obviously the um, the order of the fly is following the the lady or lady of Cankerwall. The you know the herald is following you know the the great unclean or the Papa Nurgle directly, maybe more directly, you know, and so, you know, it's a game of telephone, you know. Too true, too true. Um, and so in terms of like just straight up plot, we the, the, the setting is this, that like we've got our undead folks hunkered down in their, in their bastion or whatever it is, you know, their, their fortress or fort at the very least. And, and Nurgle comes, like you said, comes and knock and kicks the door and, and, and basically is, ruining their day they've got the upper hand they've probably got the numbers at this point um so nurgle seems to want to end this story real quick uh and tamra with with her followers that she she sent some of her human followers to escape she's doing what she can to save her people which is also i think it's worth noting is she's very duty driven or very bound to her people she's very uh you know she's fond of them she's attached to them um and so she's praying to nagash uh and she's not necessarily getting an answer right away, which I think permeates throughout this whole story is where's Nagash, what's Nagash doing? He's supposed to be protecting us, where is he? Um, so she's praying, she's doing what she can to protect her people. And lo and behold, her prayer in a way is answered, but not necessarily in the way she expects because boom, out from the sky drops our favorite uh, Mortark because it's the one I've most, I read most recently, uh, Neferata out of nowhere bringing her more talk and i guess her, her vampires probably show up at the same time and your blood knights yeah yeah her blood knights and they and they they clear house they come last minute to save the day um and here we get uh not not just a glimpse but this is the the, the start of our relationship throughout the story with neferata she's uh she's snarky she's aloof um obviously she came to save these folks but by no means is she particularly fond of them per se uh but she does save the day when when necessary would were you guys surprised to see neferata i was surprised to see her in this role like every time we've seen neferata before be it end times or uh uh book 10 Spear, shadow Rune gate wars um or in the in the actual book itself like she's been she's not been like in uh a person of action she's not she's been getting her hands dirty right and and typically she's been like it's been we've seen her when her schemes have come unraveled and so it's been hard to believe her as like this ultimate schemer like oh she's a spy master or whatever but we only ever see her in this in this time of like you know things kind of went south and now she's like shocked that she's having to get her hands dirty uh and I, I found her to be a real weak character before this i really liked her i thought she was i thought she was super cool um she had some depth to her she's making these schemes but she's also like doing things making things happen like she doesn't seem like uh you're not like well how did this person ever get to be this powerful like she seems totally incompetent you're like whoa badass like i i can i can see what she's got going on um so i thought this this is the best i've ever seen her written um be it in in age of sigmar or prior you know and yeah. that just as a thought and just the way you described that made me think of it i wonder if that's the difference between the age of chaos and the age of Sigma, right? Because we've seen her a little, I mean, less so, like, let's put the end times aside. Um, maybe back in the day, she used to get her hands dirty, but as time goes on, she's less and less inclined to do so. I, I don't know that anything in this book would maybe lead to that transition. Maybe it would. Um, but I wonder if you could make the argument that it's it's the, the time frame that is that distinction. Because I agree. Yeah, you're right. Before she, she, the things I've read before this book made me agree with what your, your perspective was on her. I, I think you make that argument. I think it's, I think it's just, and I, I think, in reality, it is uh, we've got somebody who's got a, a more active vision of what she could be, like Josh Reynolds, just doing a better job of writing her. But it, you know, it is possible that it's an intentional thing. But I think True. Just, I think she's just better written than she's been. In yeah. the guys, let's yeah. uh, let's read the Neferata book coming, and we'll we'll come to that conclusion. Yeah, as an aside, I 
completely agree with Davey. I think like, this is easily the best characterization that we've had in Navarata. Uh, it, it's fantastic to see her actually be a general that you would put on the battlefield in Age of Sigmar and be like, you're going to kill something and this is going to be good. Right? Um, but I think a lot of it might have to do with the way that he set her in the story, which is that we're fighting with Tamra, we're fighting with their brother, we're fighting against this realm of Nurgle, but it's specifically the praying to Nagash, and Nagash doesn't answer. And so who answers? But it's Neferata, right? And she answers because Nagash is in a place where he's not able to actively assist. And so I think he put her in a place where she can't just be a master of spies, right? Because she's missing her god. She has to be active. She has to be fighting because there is no one to back her up if this fails, which is a really interesting perspective to put in and, and kind of broaches in on that whole actual approach of the way that Nagash is portrayed in this book, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, you know, I think I, you nailed Neferata pretty well. You're right. It, she, she sort of rises to the occasion. Like she, this isn't, this may or may not be her, her forte, but she's got to do it because she's missing, you know, a very vital component of, you know, the, the org structure, whatever you want to call it. Good point. And we find out later she's got some some ulterior motives as well that may require her to be on the ground. Sure. I never trusted her from day one. Um, so- uh, little housekeeping, <laughs> too, just kind of looking back. I think and just it reminded me um, in our timeline, it the, the Order of the Fly and Gorm are coming out of the realm of life. So it's potentially in the Age of Chaos where Garan has already kind of suffered pretty big losses. Maybe yeah, sure. Alariel has retreated. Um, and, you know, like we know that the Pantheon has maybe split already because we talked about, uh, you know, Nagash's, you know, maybe fell. He somehow let Chaos in and, and fought the Chaos and the Chaos won. Um, and, uh, and so Garan has been kind of conquered a bit by Nurgle and they're coming this way. So that's, I, I wondered if that, that resonated at all too, just kind of as a timeline. Well, it does. Cause I think they're a little cocky too. Um, especially coming off, uh, a realm that I imagine probably put up a fight to like come, you know, stomping through a realm that, you know, gods at half, you know, if half strength, if they're lucky. So like, they probably thought there wasn't going to be much of a resistance. And uh, at the beginning of the book, you probably get that impression, I think, from mm-hmm. the Order of the Five. They're, they're pretty, I mean, as, as much as a knightly order is going to be anyways, but they're, they're, they're pretty sure of themselves. You get that, too. Yep. So just, just kind of fun kind of adding a little bit more timeline to it. Good point. Um, so Neferata comes and saves the day. She says, we got we to gotta get out of here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you. I don't know if she says it, but she, we're going we're gonna to take you and meet up with the rest of your clans because it's not just you out here, you being Tamara and her Rictus clan. There's a whole range of clans out there. So uh, she saves the day and they, they, she leads them, leads them out. Do they take some secret tunnels or something or is that everybody else? I think a lot of people went out through the secret tunnels uh, to escape. Um, but I think once Neferata came in and was able to kind of stave off that wave, and there was some sense that that was kind of the the eager, too eager first wave of Nurgle that of the of the order that kind of was coming and loping through there and all that kind of stuff. Too true. Yeah, they weren't fighting the full force. They were they were dealing with a, an offshoot of the larger battle. Yeah. But it also uh, talks a little bit about Tamra and how tortured she is to leave her family behind. True. true yeah. Right. They are dead. They've been killed. But even so. It's the, I'm not going to be able to raise them. I'm not going to be able to be with them, right? Like, it is, even in loss, it is torture. Yeah. Because of how this tribe functions, right? I mean, because she She, failed them. Yeah, exactly. It's that she has failed them, right? They didn't die fighting a superior foe. Her job was to keep them alive. She's the Voivode, and she has failed. Which is a really, just, like, interesting perspective. You guys know how voivodes are, right? Ugh, classic. I avoid void them. Oh. This, uh, so I I don't remember who we joked about this, but like feral was the rule uh, was the word in uh, <laughs> Plague Plague Garden that I was like, yeah. all right, well, I got to look this up. And now it's all over the place. I I was like three sentences into this book. I'm like, well, I guess I got to look up voivode because that's right here. <laughs> Is, does it actually have a definition? I assumed it was something he just made up. No, that's no, a real no. thing. It's, it's like a Eastern European chieftain or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Oh, that's awesome. cool. I, I, that's awesome. I'm gonna crush a trivia night. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does Reynolds just have like a Thesaurus <laughs> open all the time? I, mean, I guess most, yeah. a lot of authors do. It's not just. I gotta him. figure this is something like you know, and and this is, this is something I appreciate about authors that, you know, read a little more broadly, like read some history instead. Of, like if you, sometimes I feel like you get. Uh, players or authors that just like all they do is immerse themselves in fantasy, fantasy, sci-fi, fantasy, sci-fi, fantasy, and don't reach out anywhere. But there's so much you can pull from other areas, um, and uh, and that's those are the people who can break these tropes instead of being so drenched in this is how it's supposed to be. They can pull in from other places, and so I I, I mean this is going really far abroad from the fact that he used the word boy vote, but uh, <laughs> well, I conclude from that that like he. He reads outside of this. Like that's not a word you're just going to happen upon uh, by flipping through the dictionary. I mean, maybe, True. but uh, I think he must have been reading something. He said, "Oh, that's interesting. Like I, I can use that." In an uh, interview or two, I've 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 heard him or not heard him, see, read him say as much. Actually, he he. I think the impression I get that he does read abroad. Oh my gosh, we love Reynolds on this podcast. Word of the oh, day calendar. Yes, absolutely. Completely word of the Reynolds. day calendar is the secret. Yeah, boy <laughs> vote is going to be in a word of the day calendar. I it could I defy be. you to find that calendar. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have a niche calendar that stands out next to all the other word of the day calendars, why wouldn't you have one that has a boy vote on it and make that your your pitch? Okay. So, like, day yeah. one is Ferial, day two is boy vote. What is day three going to be? <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on, a fantasy word of the day calendar would do all right, actually. <laughs> right, like, write that down. Day Particulous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic! All right, so is is that is that where we draw the line for section one? Like, what 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 comes next? I think we're pretty good. Are we in the middle? So, yeah. right, so, so middle. It's a big middle. Middle. middle um, we're gonna we're gonna skip talking about. So there's kind of two uh, new other places that that the book takes place. One is is a uh, uh, fortress, but we're gonna save that for the third act. Yeah. We get some back and forth between again what's happening with the the order of the fly in their tra- in their travels towards this place, and we get uh, conversations that are happening at this place. But let's focus on the travel of the order of the fly f- from where they we meet them in the beginning, and kind of their whole caravan uh, towards this final destination. I like it. Good plan. Um, what's the time of year? winter time though do we know it's not winter all the time there i guess Hard to i think say. who knows um there Bad is answers. a part at the end where um Neferata remembers when the place was kind of warm and springtime okay gotcha, gotcha. so that it's, it's potential that there it, it's possible that at the moment it's just winter all the time like mm-hmm. who knows how seasons work the gas a giant douche when he makes <laughs> like, up. I'm unhappy. Yeah. Winter. <laughs> it's the winter of my discontent. Yeah. The winter of my discontent. For 1,700 years. Yeah. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's wintertime. And while, I mean, the, the, the blessed of Nurgle are more durable than, than most. You and me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't make a like thousand mile march through the desert wilderness. You know, I can't make the march winter. from my front door to my car. It sucks here. Why do I, I still turn, live here? I turned forty this year. It's not happening. Uh, so, I need um, a garage. I need a garage now. Um, but but they're finding. I mean, the winter. Um, they still need to eat. They still need to sleep sometimes. Um, and uh, you know, so this is this is a much different experience. Than they had in Garan. Just a real quick thought. Just is a, if if somebody would ask you before this book if the the followers in Nurgle had to eat, would you have said yes? Mortals, I think yes. I wouldn't have thought that, but just it's just a weird. It like caught me off guard. I'm like, oh, they gotta eat something. That's weird. Carry on. Just yeah. A, just a thought. What carry on? Yeah, they. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's fine. It's on the menu. <laughs> carry on my wayward oh, son. Oh, no. I accidentally no. clicked hang up. Oh no. <laughs> we're done now right that was it, that was uh, it the uh, forever, forever. And, then everybody, and then everybody dies and then uh, everybody... Yeah. <laughs> Scott Reed so, turn it off now again they just right? ignore just stops existing. so what's the first challenge they run into so some of it is food right and, and cold 
I honestly can't remember. It was two months ago. Was it the 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 giant <laughs> Tomb King fans? And picture this: instead of sand, snow, and out of the snow, a bone giant rages. Um, a, a raging a bone. bone giant. Giant. So we get the, we do get the scene of Nagash kind of looking over things, right? Just. His eyes, like, again, he's almost, it feels like he's almost seen now, an out-of-body experience. He doesn't know exactly who he is or, or how he's different than everything around. But he, he, he kind of knows that this force is here. And I think it's from that kind of just noticing that this bone giant springs up out of the, the earth and starts just whack a uh, splatting, popping. Even, these, these, uh, these pus boils? No, these uh, these Nurgle followers, um, and so we just get this really cool scene of this bone giant just t- going to task uh, on these guys, catching them by surprise, and and depleting quite a bit of their force. Uh, so that that brings up the point I was kind of hoping to address in a little bit, <clears throat> which is that um, can we talk a little bit about how Nagash appears in this book, right? Like, so he's kind of this lost ego right so he has this power he has this ability but in order to actually exert his ability it seems to take a little bit out of him that he's not able to replace right so arcan talks a little bit about how every day the same thing happens every day the same cycle repeats itself Hmm. no i think that's a good parallel to have right now rather than wait to the end yeah, he. So I, I think he. So there's a, a moment where he and Nagash speak, mm-hmm. and after they're done talking, it's not a very like substantive conversation, but after Nagash, the the presence of Nagash leaves, uh, I think, or or towards the end, Narkan says like we had this conversation yesterday, um, like so. There's this again that the idea of a, a senile um, entity that. Again, it doesn't isn't as attached to his form and his plans and all those kinds of things that he once was. Um, and and to your point, yeah, I mean he's I mean he's a he's a battery that recharges, and when he exerts himself, he he depletes some of that. And the part of what he wants to do is he needs about a century of rest, um, and is what he kind of talks about in order to replenish himself. And what's at risk here? Is that he's in, like we said, he's in sticks. He's in this. Stigix? Stigix. Yeah, he's in I mean, this realm it's, below it's the realms. Issue. He's in this realm below the realms, mm-hmm. this uh, below the realm of Shyish, in this pocket place similar to Alarial, right? Um, and part of what's sprung out of here is that there's these gates that lead to Stigix, and they there's nine of them. They appear every every year, they change. Every nine months. Every nine months. months. Yep. Uh, they change locations in the realms. <clears throat> Finding them is hard to impossible. Um, and Gorm has has found out where one is at the moment. And so part of the goal of the of Gorm, not necessarily the order of the fly, is to find Nagash and, and while his battery is depleted, crush his life. Snuff him mm-hmm. out. Um, and so what, but what Nagash needs is to be left alone and to be able to, to have that time to recharge after, um, re- he's still reeling from this recent defeat by Arkham. Um, so to recap that, but you're, you're absolutely right, Paul. Like there's this, there's this conversation that seems to happen every day with, you know, and, and, uh, a point of sympathy for Nagash, right? Uh, a place, I mean, if you've ever, if you've ever been with a loved one who, Every day, you know, you, every time you see them, they're asking, like, who are you? Um, you know, that, that sort of thing is um, kind of what Archon is, is experiencing with the Gash, is that, you know, he's, he's expressed his loyalty to this all-powerful being who doesn't necessarily remember who he is or, or, or what, what, his, what he's supposed to be doing right now. I haven't, ex- I haven't experienced it, but I have seen uh, 50 First Dates, the movie, which is basically the same thing. Um, this is a little far, thanks, Davey. Uh, this is a little far field, but it, it's just worth mentioning just as a thought. Um, 
I think this story really highlights the fact of, or, or, or um, gives you reason to sympathize with Nagash because he's so like looking forward past the age of cast. He's so like ticked off that Sigmar is stealing his souls. And like the way you read it, especially from the Stormcast perspective, you're like, oh man, stop being so mad. Like, why, why are you so grumpy? It, he needs those souls, right? He needs that to like, to replenish himself. And so like, he's, he's, you know, hurting, especially in, through the age of chaos and, you know, just an old man, it's talking about Sinal, um, you know, shaking his fist at Sigmar for stealing all his, his souls. Well, I mean, he, he's in rough shape without him. Like he needs that to get, you know, back to full power. And I guess I never really realized that, that until I read this book. And it, it, it makes it easier to be on his side, at least from that, that particular argument. Yeah. Well, and even from a, a more grounded perspective, right? Neferata and Archon, like they're literally dealing with an insane God, right? And this insane God has the power to kill them at any moment. Those and the every worst day they have to deal with his insanity. Yeah. It is just such a like, I mean, there's a conversation between Neferata and Archon talking about how do you do this? Right, like, how do you deal with this insane god coming to you every day? Because Archon is basically his lodestone, right? Like, uh, Reynolds, I don't know if it's Reynolds or uh, etc. But they've talked about how Nagash is this all-powerful being, but he has put small parts of himself into the Mortarks, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are his touchstones, right? So when he gets to a point where he is not able to be himself, such as when Archaon destroys him. And he has to bring himself back to who he was. Part of that process is touching these lodestones of who he is in order to remember who he's supposed to be. And so part of being a Mortark is serving this all-powerful God that will be destroyed. At this point, like it's happened multiple times, right? That will be destroyed and then enduring his insanity until he is well enough to, to start being sane. But even when he is sane, he's not sane, right? It, it's like there are these levels of insanity, and this is the one that's really hard to deal with. The level of insanity when he's at full power is like, well, okay, you can just make the world into what you have. You just described my two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one. Um, no, I, I, I agree with you. I must be it must be difficult. And I think they express the, the difficulty throughout the book. You get that, you get that perspective from them um, quite a bit. Uh, but we're, we're talking order of the fly. Um, so they, they, they deal with a, a bone giant. And do they do anything fancy to take him down? I think just through sheer numbers, they're able to uh, overcome him. Uh, but that's not the, the last by any means, or even the, the most difficult of the, the challenges they face. Uh, as they progress closer and closer to the fortress where the rest of the undead are hanging out, not, you know, I'm going to say undead, but you know, where, where you know, uh, Tamara and her followers are, uh, is the next one, the ogres, uh, dire wolves. Oh, dire. How could I forget the dire wolves? Oh man. What a dummy. <laughs> well, and there's this, there's what's cool about the description of the dire wolves is they talk about how fast they move, uh, faster than, than a living being could. And so, um, uh, and they, they kind of pour through, so they're set up as in camps, um, and they kind of pour through into the camp in these kind of outer rings. And you kind of, you can definitely, I feel like, imagine like a knightly army set up in in their kind of class system, and you know, inner rings, outer rings, and yeah. probably a jousting court somewhere, right? Well, there's got to be, got to be. Um, so I think the dire wolves hit, but but it's not too far after that that. Uh, um, that you get a sense, yeah, and, the, and there's even a moment where there, there's some of this, again, Nagash is kind of flitting from the, you know, he's seeing through the eyes of different beings of dead, you know, dead beings. Mm -hmm. um, but we get, yeah, we get this idea of these, these, these ogres torn from their slumber, and I didn't get it right away. I thought, you know, we had these, I thought it was zombie ogres, right. but it turns out to be what? More interesting. A little more interesting. <laughs> what is it? What is it? They're like wraith ogres, right? Like there are these weird ghostly ogres and it's, uh, you know, so some characteristic of ogres is this um, idea that they're always hungry and you can take that into like a internally hungering spirit. Like that's a, that's a pretty cool thing to, to grab. So, yeah. um, yeah. So these, um, hungering spirits 
hungering Ogor spirits. And they do quite the number on on this camp. Um, one, I think they hit while they're sleeping, um, which is pretty devastating. And they're just hard to hard to stop. Um, I think it ends up being Gorm that comes in with his spell fire and some sort of protection spell that he creates um, in the middle of the camp that ends up kind of helping dissipate them and kind of call the survivors to the the center. And I don't, am I remembering wrong? I don't even think they beat him. I think they just out they just outlast him, and eventually they like they leave. Yeah, which is a weird. I mean, you're not that's not common. Like in terms of these stories and seeing these battles written out that just sometimes you just got to hunker down and wait for the bad guys to go away. Um, which I thought was delightful. Also, I didn't want to see the ogres get beat. So kudos to you Reynolds. Uh. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think they, they make it through a lot of that. They kind of, um, uh, they definitely get pound down quite a bit. Um, I think there's, I was trying to think if there was another, Anything else with Nagash during this time? Um, we do get a glimpse of Manfred um, early on when Nagash is kind of floating between things. That that uh, Manfred is fighting alongside some uh, some humans. Perhaps is it the um... Dave? You wanted to talk about this? Yeah, go ahead, Davey. I mean, it's a it's a flashback to Hellstone, which yeah. is. Uh, something that we'll see again later. So this is like how Hellstone fell, right? Yep. Uh, and then later there'll be a return to Hellstone uh, with the audio dramas. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's uh, one of those things where like you don't have to know, you don't have to notice the connection, but it, it's a pretty fun thing for those, you know, like they, they like seeding in those things. They're like, oh, I know who that is or I know where that is or, you know, just uh, throwaways thing to, to reward somebody who's been... Uh, you know, kind of reading broadly yeah. of the Age of Sigmar fiction. Sure. Well, and so, it takes, well, just real quick, it just, it just takes the infinite, you know, the, the nigh infinity of the moral realms and really cements a lot of the stories and the places and the locales and the things. Um, because it, I can imagine for somebody just jumping into it, it, it seems real daunting, but when you, you pepper this stuff in, yeah. um, it makes it that much more digestible. It, it, it makes it so, you know, not, not relatable in that you relate to them, but you, it's, you're able to, pick out recognizable places and things. And that really sure. draws you in. We get our, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, this is, I'm probably going to sound like an idiot, but um, in the audio dramas, why change the, Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's why I continue to keep talking. Uh, Manfred ends up harnessing these ogres to fight against um, his opponents. Right. Do you think it's the same ogres? And that's my question. Is it the same ogres? Because they had the red wall with the tower, and then they ended up getting defeated. But are these the same ogres from the audio dramas? He gets straight up zombie ogres, though. So I'm I'm gonna say something different. But, okay. Yeah. Ugh, Davey, you're no fun. I, well, <laughs> maybe I'm I mean, but I'm pretty sure there's zombie do you, ogres. Do you think that they can take like the spirits and make those into like wraiths, yeah, and then take the bodies and make yeah. them into zombies, like double the pleasure, double the fun? That's oh, wow. What that, that's what that means, I think. Reuse, renew, recycle. Deep questions. All right. I love it. I love it. Um, that was pretty cool. I was all, all about the oversight. Also, was this a classic, uh, like, ethereal situation where they couldn't damage him for a little bit, too? Anyways, that was, you know, the age-old ethereal rule. Um, well, I think there's a part here where he's looking at uh, Manfred, and we get our kind of first... Um, sense of how Nagash views his Mortarks. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks about um, Manfred being kind of his rebellious streak. Like his, even in his sense of needing order, um, that, that Manfred is always scheming against him and always trying to do these things. And he always has to, he knows they're happening and he always has to kind of slap them down. But at the same time, he, he's always letting them happen. He's always letting Manfred be Manfred. Um, and we think about, you know, kind of how he, how Manfred, you know, did, did the old world in the end times. We think about how we, you know, thought Manfred was going to be great in the, you know, be reformed in the audio drama and kind of how he ended up there. Um, and, you know, the story of Hellstone and just that there's the, that Manfred is that part that, that Manfred is an embodiment of a part of Nagash that, that also kind of, to me, 
screams about kind of his betrayal of the pantheon, right? Um, this idea that he made an oath, but he's like, you know, my oath is really to myself. Um, and so, you know, just kind of, uh, there, there's definitely a, in a little bit of like a, a father son, you know, or a, a parent child kind of thing going on in his kind of observation of Manfred. Um, and we learned different things about the other Mortar Mortarks a little bit later. Um, but uh, this it was one of the first places we get kind of the sense that, and and just like we talk about, like that the this place, the former em, this former empire that is now in ruins is like Nagash's body, right? Sure. Um, these Mortarks are his embodiment, and and um, they are they are his will sent forth. This is what's left of him at the moment, mm. acting. Uh, acting in the world, so. True, true. Uh, do they come up against anything else? Crossing uh, the frozen lake, right? The, yeah. Sure. Classic frozen lake situation. Gnarly zombie gargants. Yeah. And this is what made me realize, think, and confirm that a bone giant is different than a zombie gargant. Right? Right? Tomb Abs King? Yeah. Absolutely. You're uh, wrong. So they find themselves... Uh, faced with the lake that needs that needs crossing um i think it's frozen over because it's winter time that's what happens in the lakes especially here um and everybody's a little a little tepid uh as to whether or not they should cross it or how they should go about it but of course that you know everybody needs to put on a show so they're 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 gonna they're gonna cross it and as they're making their way across the lake um the ice doesn't break in the traditional sense but rather a bunch of z zombie giants Garb ants um, come crashing out of it and start, you know, laying waste to the army. I don't know how there's still an army left at this point. They've had a hard, right. hard, hard go of it, but uh, yeah. and they attack him. Oh no! Spooky and it's, scary. Uh, I mean, but it, it, it's a cool, like we've talked about, the Order of the Fly being these crusaders, and you got the, uh, uh, you got the King Arthur Bretonian vibe, right? Well, like this is perfect. Like, like let's bring down these monsters. They bring down these giants, and so they, you know, sally forth and look to bring them down. And they're struggling and fighting. Uh, and again, um, the uh, demon contingent comes to the rescue here, and they do a pretty gnarly thing where they like fuse uh, the giants uh, together and like make the giant that make the gargants into a bridge. Yeah, but like, yeah, it's pretty gross. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, the they they managed to like defeat the zo these zombies. And their their corpses are floating in the water. The 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 um, uh, plague bearers take some of the vines from the Sylvaneth palaquin, yeah. and and the vines just kind of they self weave into the corpses, and then nerdlings jump in into the middle, and Balefire goes in and like melts the corpses together and fuses them. Yeah. Um, into the yeah, this, this giant like twitching gargant zombie, uh, you know, wobble bridge. Are uh, so cool. <laughs> did you ever feel like this was a metaphor for assembling GW terrain with the Because <laughs> that's really what it came to. <laughs> I didn't, but now I do. Yeah. <laughs> The next time somebody's assembling a terrain, you're like, yeah, isn't it like trying to fit zo zombie corpses into a bridge? If I only had some nerglings to straight up cram themselves in here and become blue. It'd be amazing. And and Gorm Gorm says to one of the like I think he says it to Festerbite, who does not like Gorm at all. He's like, Those nerglings really get in there, don't they? <laughs> yeah, he's pretty proud of that. Creepy. Super great. It's like, yeah, thanks, Uncle Gorm. <laughs> so, Are you uh, drunk, Uncle Gorm? Come on. There's, there's a there here. There's also when when Festerbite kind of volunteers to go out and check the ice. He's doing so because it's his duty. But he's got some knights that are are with him, and some of them are kind of like, hey, is this? I mean, why are we doing this? You know, um, you know, why are we taking so long? We should be getting out there, and because Gorm wants the the contingent to go faster and get to the this place and just get it done with because he's wanting this distraction so he can go take care of this of the find this gate to nagash like he wants them to go over and just like take care of them so because he knows that his time's limited the longer he waits for kind of to to do this the the more powerful nagash will be when he shows up right um 
And so he's, you know, there's part of Festerbyte's contingent going, hey, we should be going faster. Why are we taking so long? Um, and and Festerbyte kind of brings them in line, and they kind of realize that the demons are their allies, but not their friends, right? You can, you know, they're, they're both serving Nurgle, but that doesn't mean that that they care about the what we care about. The that we're the order of the fly. We have a um, we have a commitment to in a, in a bond to the chalice, not to these these demons. Um, so the, the you know kind of cul- culminates this kind of thing. And one of the things that uh, again Gorm's kind of saying, "Hey, come on, can you guys hurry up?" In the middle of of um, oh, what's his name? What's the W? Who's our main? Wilgus. Uh, Wilgus. Wilgus is trying to do a ritual and 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 give the chalice to his knights, his head knights and whatnot, and kind of do this properly and prepare them for battle. And Gorm just kind of ju- jumps in and goes, "Hey, Kong, let's get going." Um, and so there's just there's this final tension that where the uh, Wilgus is like, "Hey, you've asked us to do this. We're going to do this our way. We've done it your way, and it's not gone well for us. So we're going to take it from here." And this kind of makes uh, um, Gorham impatient, and he realizes, okay, I have to expend some of my energy that I'm sa- I've been saving for what I want to save all my magic and all my energy for when I face Nagash, but I'm going to use some of it now to put a, a tear in the uh, tear in the fabric and, and call some demons out. Um, probably should jump back to now and talk about what they've been doing in this fort yeah basically hanging out just chill yeah. yeah nothing nothing special well uh, to be fair what i really enjoyed about this is like the nurgle forces all along the way like man they're getting their butts kicked like they're they're suffering a lot but meanwhile like it'll switch back to the fortress and they're they're legit scared they're like man i don't think there's any way we can hold out like the size of this force coming in like let's pull everything we can together so like the table is set where both forces feel like legitimately at risk, right? Like there's, there's a threat to both sides. And sometimes in these, we see one that's like super overconfident, like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to see things through. Only the faithful. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> the, the Nurgle forces are doubting themselves and the Tamara and her crew, they're doubting themselves. Like, man, like what, what are we going to be able to do to like somehow make our stand here? Um, and it kind of, I don't know. Somehow it it uh, because it makes the outcome in doubt, or you know that the stakes are up a little bit as as it is where everyone thinks they're at risk. Like that makes it that much more engaging. I thought it was a I thought it was a very clever move um, to to keep you invested in both sides all all along the way. Absolutely. I I also thought it was really interesting that they had this whole tension between Tamra and the other Voivodes about whether or not they're going to stay. Or whether or not they're going to flee, right? Like, well, let's let's back that up and, and set that scene a little bit more. So they show up, and they are, yeah, all of the voivoids. So so Tamara is a voivoid. There's other voivoids. Nefarad has brought them all together. Go. Mm-hmm. And it, it it really is just a, this tension of the old versus the new, right? Like, Tamara is a woman. She's a young younger uh, Voivode that kind of alluded to that at the beginning of the story. They get into the idea that there are these older Voivodes that have been managing their tribes forever. Tamra's whole tribe has already been wiped out. Most of the other Voivodes that are here, their tribes have not been wiped out, right? They saw the writing on the wall and they came back to the castle. And so there's this tension between we can't escape if we want to, but Tamra's like, but if we escape, we just keep running. Right. And there's also this tension of do we prepare for the fight? Do we split our forces? What's the best way to actually manage this crisis? And meanwhile, we have Neferata and even um, Neferata's lieutenant, which I'm completely blanking on the name at the moment. Adima. Adima, uh, who are really playing on Tamara's emotions. And they're setting up this decision that she has to make that we're not really privy to. Um, And this decision is basically whether or not she's going to be the one who chooses to lead this army, right? And it leads her to this terrible choice of going back to the beginning, how we're talking about how this has ruined civilization. 
And these are the remains of what this great civilization was. And the great civilization was led by these kings, and they basically rose too high for their station. And so Nagash came through who knows how long ago and smashed them to pieces and divided them into these disparate small clans, as opposed to this immense great civilization that they once were. However, these kings are still there. They are undead and they are trapped within a prison. And Tamara can hear them. And so Neferata is preparing her to make the decision to allow these kings to be released. But of course, Nagash still has the memories of who he was, even if he doesn't have control over his senses. And Neferata cannot betray Nagash's command that they be imprisoned. But if Tamar makes this choice, then it's not Neferata being disobedient. Right. It's Tamra. Right. What else do we have in this? Um, so yeah, we've got this conclave of, of voivoids all leading the different parts of these these people that are the broken remnants of the the broken kings, which are the the ones who were punished for for defying Nagash, trying to decide whether or not they're going to stay and defend or flee to the Rhyme Islands. Um, they get in their long boats and shove off, or are they going to try and protect the north? Um, we've, yeah, you said we've got we've got the old and the new. We've got yeah, Tamra is seen as fairly young, um, but Neferat has taken a liking to her. Uh, there's some, I, I I really enjoy the interactions between Tamra, Neferata, and Edema. There's just a kind of this. Uh, some of it's just a. Some of it's a cattiness. Some of it's a. Um, uh, some of it is a kind of distrust from Adima towards mortals. Right now that she's lived so long as a as a vampire, um, but we also find out that Adima and her sisters are also part of this. Um, a part of this clan, I think. Or part of this kingdom that uh, that was destroyed, but instead of being destroyed, that Neferata had had taken them and allowed them to uh, live in and seek vengeance, um, or not live, unlive. Um, <laughs> um, and so there's a little bit more of a twist there, where um, you know, I think Adima once was a voivod or something to that effect. In, in some of this clan. And so there's a little bit of like, you know, again, old, new. Uh, does this new, this young girl have the strength that we need? Um, there's a couple other, yeah, there's there's another group that gets called into here. Does anybody want to? Well, yeah, I mean, just to hark up, like, just recap to what we talked about, I think what we're getting a lot from from the death side of things is, is a series of choices, right? Do we stay? Do we go? Do we enlist the help of the the undead kings or do we leave them locked up um and furthermore there's there's another opportunity for choices do, do we ally ourselves with this kingdom this this group i don't know whatever the term is for a group of uh, uh oh gosh what are they called flesh eater yeah. parts yeah um, because not only are there, you know, the, the, the kings of old and in their sort of ghost shapes, there's also other kingdoms that were uh, driven feral by Nagash as well. And so they find in the hills this, you know, contemporary kingdom of, of those kings that have fallen um, in the form of a flesh eater court. And I love these guys. Uh, up until this point, I have had no real interest in flesh eater courts whatsoever. I thought it was a little... Um, shoehorned in just sort of the idea of how to you know be creative with the way uh, these flesh eater courts work but this is the, a prime example of of how i think they should be implemented and uh, a unique way to sort of use that classic mad group of feral humanoids who, who think of delusions of grandeur and, and what have you because it's 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 that to a t you've got this this kingdom that has fallen um, in in Shyish, but who have been turned into these you know mad cannibalistic uh, creatures, um, who in the story still think that they are this this mighty kingdom, but obviously we all know that all know that they're not, and it's a matter of trying to convince them not not trick them per se, but coerce them into um, defending this this stronghold that they're using. So it's it's an example of the death faction 
um, trying to use all the resources available to them, even if they have to call on a, you know, a, a mad king and his cannibalistic followers. Um, there's the whole thing about the king thinking that it, um, Tamara is like his long lost sister, though like he deep down he knows not really, like he knows he's crazy, but like he's still like just what he has to deal with. Um, yeah. Like you, every once in a while, you surfaces and realize, like, yeah, I don't know, like I, I know that I'm wrong, but then like drops back into yeah, it, like, not worth it. Like I'm not gonna mess with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Once they, as I say, when they they get into battle, and there's this or a couple of those moments where I think they, you know, like they get struck, or you know, he he strikes this um, flight king or this knight, and his his followers jump on them and start ripping them apart, and for a moment he sees it as these monsters ripping apart this corpse and then he it, like his brain realigns and he's like no no it's it's my my warriors dispatching with you know this sort of thing and and like he uh for a moment like he's like looking at one of his servants and he sees two faces um and he's trying to figure out which one is the right one and one is of this you know bestial thing and one is uh you know this this you know uh knightly warrior or whatever and so yeah that that whole like crazy king um you know, the, you know all the all the things that are described in the Flesh Eater Court book about their delusions and and who they think they are compared to who they are is is used in in small amounts, but just enough to where you you get it. Like the the um, um, vampire, what is it called? The <sighs> Barwolf? No, the, what's the king called in in uh, in the Flesh Eater Court book? The Anybody? Bueller? No, it's on my head. Stragoy. Right. He was called the Stragoy. Ghoul King. The Ghoul <laughs> King. Go. Uh, this Ghoul King. Works. <laughs> so this Ghoul Probably King, that it's a vampire, has a very, like, uh, you know, is a very, it just, again, seems like kind of a an old king. Um, but he, yeah, he slashes this guy with his claws, and he's like, not my claws. No, not my claws, my sword. You know, and all this kind of stuff. So they, they, they play that real, real well. It's, it's subtle in a couple of spots. But they, they, the creep factor is high uh, with them as well. Uh, yeah, can, I, cool. can I just say there's an amazing moment of brilliance here in this writing. Uh, so he's got Tamara, right? And she's got these two allies. And one of them is her ancestors that have been banished, right? By Nagash. And the other one is this crazy ghoul king who is control of an overwhelming force. And if we look at the book as a whole... We look at the Mortarks and we've got Neferata and Archon, and they have this overwhelming force that is crazy that they have to listen to because he has this immense power, and he is using all of the things that he's defeated in order to fight the army. So Tamra is literally facing the choice that Nagash is forcing his Mortarks to face in this book. It's an amazing amount of foreshadowing and just well-written characterization. Well, to well I think this out. there's a few pieces we haven't talked about yet that that highlight that. So I think that that case becomes more as we reveal a few things. One, um, so there's these broken kings that, as we mentioned, have called out to her to free them, and and Nefrata spent some time working with her to show her that that she can silence them. Right, that they call out to her, and if she wants them to be silenced, she can silence them with her will. And we, Nef, uh, Tamara doesn't realize this yet, but but Nefrata speaks to Adima in private, and or maybe to herself as she's talking about this. And this was a point that that we talked about just briefly that uh, in some of the reading that I got through today. But she re reveals to the reader that Tamara is the only one strong enough to do this. There hasn't been a Voivoid or a Necromancer strong enough to release the Broken Kings. Um, and so, but she talks to Tamara, just kind of keeps dropping these things. Oh, you could if you wanted to. You know, have you tried? You know, what, what if you release them? And she, you know, Tamara's like, well, should I release them? Do you want me to? And, and Nefra's like, no, no, yeah. I, that would be, you know, that's against Nagash's will. And I don't have that power. I don't have the power. I'm a Mortark, but I don't have the power to go against Nagash. I am an extension of him, but if you wanted to, right? He doesn't notice you. You know, it's not a thing. So there's just this interesting 
we find out that, that Tamara is, is immensely powerful, uh, more powerful than she knows. Um, and we know that these, these broken kings are calling to her. And, and Nefra talks about how, uh, at this point, when Tamara's not around, where she hopes that Tamara does the right thing and releases them, and they will be um, t- there t- for Tamara to control, and that together with that army, Neferata will be able to shape Shyish in her image, because because Nagash is is um, is not going to be able to. So she can make the moves to form it in her image, and this is where she. And then she mentions that she'll call it New Lamia. Um, so we get also another timeline thing there, because in the the Legion of Nagash book. You know she's already established uh, New Lamia, um, and which is which is kind of cool. Um, but we also get a part where we we get Nagash's perspective on Neferata and um, Archon. Uh, that Neferata is his guile, is his cunning, is his scheming and planning, and that um, he gives her that space to to be that and to do that um, <laughs> up until the point at which it no longer serves him. Right? I mean. Uh, so even though she's thinking about shaping the, the Shyish in her own image, her own image, like that's it seems like that's just Nagash's thought, and her image is going to end up being his image, right? There's not a way she gets out of that cycle or that kind of um, that service, right? Yeah. She, she can't truly go against him, um, whether she knows it or not. Like, right, right, right. Like there's just not there's not that free will that she's seems to think she has. Um, and then same with, and, and Archon, his, he's, he literally talks about him as being a mini me. Like Archon is, is his loyalty. And it talks about Nagash's loyalty to his servants, to the living and the dead that are in Shyish and to Shyish itself. Yeah. Um, but that he's, but these Mortarks are still so insignificant compared to him. Um, so, so we get again this this idea, and, and to your point, Paul, is that Nagash uses death to these dead things to whatever he wants, and we'll we'll see a little bit like the ult, penult, or the the ultimate form of that uh, uh, in a minute. But but uh, but yeah, and so um, we get to the point of battle. We talked about the the flesh eater courts are coming in; they're fighting. The um, zombies, the the voivoids are controlling zombies to try and like instead of just raising them up and saying go, they have to really kind of control them to get them to go where they need them to go in mass. Um, the blood knights are there to kind of wait for the right time to go in and do the most damage, uh, which is literally how they play on the battlefield. Yeah, like you freaking just gotta find a way to wait. You let the zombies go in and and make sure you don't get charged. Uh, <laughs> Because they'll get taken out, and then you go in and do the most damage you can. Yeah, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, it also made me wonder, like, why don't why don't we get some of their spells? Like, why doesn't Neferata make a unit fly and make them immune to uh, rend? Says <laughs> in the book, and Neferata cast her magic spell, and now they're immune to rend. No, um, and from the other perspective, like, because from the Nurgle side of things. Uh, the the herald starts pulling out the stops we referenced before but he opens up a rift and he starts pouring some demons in in his mind a little and everyone's mind a little prematurely um but to, to take out you know all the allies that the, the death have sort of accumulated is, is what he needs to do to pull out all the stops so you know yeah. flies come buzzing in plague drones and the whole you know the whole nine yards um to sort of rise to the occasion to, to, to you know reach equal footing uh, of the death army that they're they're facing um mm-hmm. And the fortress goes down, right? Yeah. Like, oh, big time. And, but yeah. it happens quick. And, and uh, it's another thing. Again, like ditching expectations. I'm expecting the end of this book is going to be this huge, long siege. And he's just like, nope, fortress fell. That's it. Well, uh, well Wolgus yeah. thought it was going to be a siege too, right? That's what, yeah. that was yeah. everyone's intention is the, yeah. the face of a siege. But um, but the demon the wouldn't smash yeah, it down. Exactly, Harold. The uh, Harold uh, is on a, on a timeline. They only got a couple months to find Nagash, and so that's why they're they're pushing forward. And that's a big internal struggle between the two of them. We don't need to get too much into it, but just basically, they're they're the the battle of wills between Wolgus, a, a patient t- tactician, versus the mm, the haste that the demons are throwing at it. Cool. But, yeah. Where Tamra is up on the top, kind of parapet of 
of this castle and it smashes down the, like the walls twist and start to fall and she leaps off of it and the spirits call she calls the spirits to her and they they kind of let her down a little more gently than if she were to smash that was real cool yeah yeah, yeah. um and so yeah so they kind of some they've had some long boats out on the Harbor? On the docks, on the harbor, yeah, docks. waiting to like fill if we have, if they have to retreat to fill and go. Um, what's what's Arcan been doing while well, everybody else is on the been, ice like, conducting some kind of ritual? What, what's yes. that about? Yeah, it's all part of a plan, right? Like he's actually just buying time. The whole thing, he knows the fortress is going down, but it's gonna burn some time. Give him a chance to do his ritual here. What's the ritual doing? Exactly. What's the ritual do, Davy? Summoning someone. I have a picture. Do you want to see the picture of what the ritual does? <laughs> you sounded so intimidating when you said that. I have a picture. All right, you see this right here? This is from Montrus Arcanum. This is called the Necrofex Colossus. So this is what Arcan summons. All right? Well. It was one of my favorite moments of the book. <laughs> Easily and, favorite moments of the book. Well, and so what, there's this point where he speaks to Nagash and he asks Nagash, can you help me lift, like, summon these these the dead from the, the depths of the sea? And the gash says, "What good are you? Like, what? Are, what? Can't you do anything yourself?" And he goes, "Well, I could do about a third of this on my own." And so Nagash decides that he should be conserving his energy, mm-hmm. but if he does this now, perhaps that will allow him the peace to have his hundred year slumber. Yeah. And so th- what we just find out at first is that they just need to raise these zombies or whatever from the depths. Um, and we also find out that Arkan is the one who told Gurm about where the, this gate was located. Yeah. So what he had found out is that, that Gurm had, had gotten this reputation um, and, and he, Arkan was actually miffed. Like once, once he found out that that Garm had taken the the Sylvaneth of the Dead Forest or whatever it was called, where that was in service to one of the um, they they protected one of the gates to Shyish, and once he found out that he had twisted them and tortured them in such a way, it was like that they don't deserve that, which was weird. It was like what? He's okay. careful. Yeah. What do you have? The soft die. spot for a tree? <laughs> uh, but he um and so uh he has this conversation with Nagash and Ash, Nagash so kind of helps out so he had planned all this to 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 lure um Gorm to this spot even though like like he used Nagash's bait <laughs> um which is pretty like a little bit dangerous right well gutsy um, yeah yeah um and so um he pulls Gorm comes onto the ice with his his demons. They start coming after Arcan. Uh, Arcan like cuts down his palaquin and lets the spirits escape. And then uh, this this boat kind of comes out of the water, and the spirits inhabit the wood of the boat and kind of lash out at Gorm. Uh, so all this kind of stuff. But but yes, all of a sudden the ice starts to crack, and this giant. Yeah, Paul. He's still showing that. Still showing that picture. This giant. It's so good. Well, what's what's this giant golem of zombies, twisted and and mashed into the shape of a giant humanoid figure of Nagash. So, like Nagash decides to embody this thing. It's and, awesome. So and cool. and to the point, I mean, Tamara looks up at this, and everybody looks up at this in such horror at the disrespect. Nagash has for the dead, yeah. like just the sense that he just does not does not have any. They they just are nothing to him. Sure, they're tools to be used and no no dignity uh, to them at all. And uh, it's basically game over. Like because of that, like I mean, you're you're dealing even with a half powered god. But like, uh, and just before this, just real, oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. aside, Tamra lets the broken kings go. Okay, okay. back to what you're saying. Which. which no, I mean you bring a good point. It seemed fairly inconsequential. Like I, I, maybe they would have fallen yeah. had they not released them. But like in the grand scheme of things, like when you know you have this, you know, atom bomb at the end. If only she would have known, I guess. Like she probably could have kept her, her and stuff. That's I think Arkan had hoped that she didn't. Wasn't sure if she would. 
um, we find out that Nafarada was the one whispering into the ears of the broken kings that caused them to rebel against Nagash. Yeah, so it's her fault. And so they and they remember that, and the the um, the flesh eater court ghoul king remembers that. We find out that the that the broken kings are the the ancestors of the drac. That the ghoul king is ancestors of the drac. Um, and so, like this is like generational, like the the dead of all the generations of the dead of the drac are here in the broken kings in the in the ghoul king and his flesh eaters um and and now so well i guess we'll come to that at the very end um nagash comes out and and whoops some yeah everybody gets everybody gets destroyed um trying to think who who one-on-ones like so like Wolgus one-on-ones neferata is it yeah yeah so this is where she actually does use some spells she like is on her her abyssal terror. She's flying over some ner- the the army. She tells it to land. She arcane bolts somebody. She goes in and, and she gets out um, her, her sword of jet. Yeah, which, jet. Uh, which when which is her brother's sword, right? Uh, we're talking uh, Neferata. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So the the her emic car or whatever it is, um, and so she fights. Wolgan, Wolgus, and uh, she uses Mystic Shield real quick. So there's a couple of those that are kind of cool. Yeah, it's Mystic uh, Shield six up. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Can't just call it. Uh, yeah, Wolgus fighting her, and he he almost takes her down. Like he surprises her, right? Like, yep. yeah, fast uh, fatties. Yeah, fast fatties. That is actually that's a recurring <laughs> that's a recurring theme with. Uh, Nurgle dudes is like, oh, it moved much faster than they expected. Like, they don't walk like fast, but once yeah. they're planted, they have good core. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's true. <laughs> so basically, at every, and, at almost every level, I'm pretty sure the, the death side of things overcomes the, the, the Nurgle side. Um, Neferata's yeah. Blood Knights take out a bunch of Nurgle. Uh, the, the, the Flesh Eater Courts do, do their work. The Undead Kings do their, you know, the Broken Kings do their work. Obviously, Bester Nagash. Bites, it's straight up drowned by the Ghoul King. Oh, well, yeah. Held underwater. That was, that was a little sad yeah. moment for me. I like Fester Bite. Yeah, Fester Bite was, yeah, okay, exactly. That was crazy. He just jumps in, and he's like holding him underwater and talking to, are you okay, my sister? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was legit. We don't, we don't get into MVPs later, but... Uh, uh, Rickon is the ghoul king. He's Rickon, he's yeah. my dude. He's my he's my MVP. King uh, yeah. Um, so the end result is, is that Nagash and his followers are are triumphant. They they do the job. Ish esque. Yeah. What, what do you say? Ish. So once all the Nurgle all the Nurgle army is just gone, Gorm gets pulled underwater and drowned. All his demons are are banished. All the um, the Order of the Fly is annihilated. Mm-hmm. Um, Nagash turns his gaze to to Archon. He says, "Have you, did you know?" He knows that the Broken Kings have been released, and he is not happy about it. That his his rule has been undone, and he's not a happy dude to begin with. So, no, for him no. to be unhappy is like, yeah, it's like happened. it's like senile guy, like senile uh, God is like snapped to attention. Like, okay, I got this. Yeah. I know, I know what's up. Uh, so. Okay. He turns his focus on on Tamra because, like, either she admits to it, or he he just knows that she's the one to, to release him. And she she makes a, I think, in my mind, a very valiant defense of why she did what she did. She's trying to save her people, and she thought at the time that was the only way to do so. This was a power that she needed. I mean, she didn't know, didn't know that Nagash was coming, so like, it, it was a last ditch effort. Can your you, people? Yeah. Can you blame her? Yeah. But Nagash no. responds with, "Not your people." my people you misunderstand all everyone is my people um and so it's sort of a back and forth where she's trying to you know get some sort of clemency or some sort of mercy and so he he grants her mercy but not in the way she expects well but uh, not and also not until arcan and nefrata yeah they intercede both, on behalf and nefrata bends the knee and begs him begs and he's even like begs who do you think this is yeah well she's not cetera all right She's just not <laughs> okay. well, and and uh, that that gets mentioned later, but uh, they only bow to to the, their god, right? To yeah. the the to death itself. 
Um, and and Nagash grants her mercy. He gives her the power of a of a Mortark of a Death Lord. I don't know what a Death Lord is. Is that a thing? That's the faction that the Mortarks are in. That are in. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. And and what what's a, what's a Death Lord without a bunch of undead doing control, right? And and he says, "I will I will save your people." And he kills every single last one of them, and brings all of the boats carrying the people back to the harbor. Just full of full of the dead, full of skeletons, yeah. of her, people that were just alive thirty minutes before that that had escaped, and he brings okay. them to her service. Careful what you ask for. Says, Here are your people, and and she just feels how, like she like in in granting her this power, like he's just stripped her a part of a part of herself, um, and who she is. So somehow. She is left with maybe some reflection of who Nagash is, um, and uh, and is now has her people to, and she realizes like that like she like her whole thing has been after this battle is done I'm going I'm not going to be a queen next to Neferata I'm not going to go see the sights all over Shyish you know that Neferata promises her I'm going to be here for my people. This is now her her fate is she is yeah. tied to to her people now. She has for it. Sounds yeah. like she's a tomb king. Yeah. I mean kind <laughs> of. She's got her people and she's here to lead them. No tomb. No stretch. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> hashtag Paul theories. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um but but and then at the I mean this again is she is now forced to like, but she looks out to her people, the broken kings, the the these white kings, uh, these wraiths, these um, all this kind of stuff, and and they need her now. They've sworn fealty to her. They are under her control. Sure. She must. She has to do that. She she tells Neferata to leave. She says get out of here. Arcan does too, I think. Well, and then yeah, Arcan comes to her side. And, and asks Neferata to go. Neferata says, "Maybe in time you'll see what what I've given you, even though it wasn't exactly as I planned." So, like Neferata was promising her to that she'd be a queen, uh, you know, amongst the dead. But this is I don't. This is not exactly what Neferata was planning. Mm-hmm. Um, but she thinks that in time, uh, Tamara will forgive her. But it's another good thing with Neferata, as she's written here, is like she's got some resiliency, which we've not seen before. Like, yeah. She doesn't just fall out. apart. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and she doesn't get provoked. <laughs> There's this one moment they're talking about how the three of the main Mortarks, how they play their games and how she she and, and Manfred would would provoke wars just to amuse themselves. And then, uh, and they do the same with Archon, but Archon would say one thing and Manfred would turn from a, a brilliant tactician to this like childhood rivalry and just yeah. become an idiot, and, you know, like <laughs> take it too personally. Um, so there's, yeah, these different personalities, but yeah, she, she's just not easy to provoke and she knows when maybe it's time to, to submit and when it's time to bow out and when it's time to let things settle and, and she plays the long game. Right. Um, but it's sure. just, it's super interesting how, again, how the Mortarks, you know, saw within her something that, and I don't know, is she a new Mortark? Is she, or is just a death lord? You know, death mages is, is would be the faction she was in before. They specifically say death lord, mm-hmm. um, and so and they talk about there being nine more tarks for the nine gates and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I would Me? say yes. I I mean I'd say no because Reynolds doesn't get to pick what the uh, more tarks are, but um, yeah. But we shall see. Right? We'll, we'll we'll find out. Um, but... I think it's. But at Akon, they did say there are more death models coming. There are oh, yeah. more new death models coming. I, I don't doubt that one whatsoever. Um, so but I, maybe. I think that's basically where it ends, though, in that yep. Tamara realizes that dead or alive, her people needed her. That's a direct quote right there. Um, she was a daughter of the Drak, and she could do no less. So yeah. I think she rises to the, rises to the occasion. Um, well, she's a less dark. <laughs> 
or no less dark. I I give you credit. You get a point for that one. Davy's um, pun. I'm just using it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Credit. <laughs> What's that? I'm asking if you get the credit or. <laughs> I mean, I'm fine <laughs> giving you the credit. I'm. I'm enjoying your pun. Have, have credit for the both of you. Um, so I guess where, where does that leave? Where does that leave everyone? Uh, this this grouping of the Order of the Flyer has been smashed. Though I think the the legend or the the wisdom of Blightmaster Wolvis lives on, because um, he's referenced in a lot of other books. Like other Order of the Fly folks know him and know his his legendary tac- tactics. Or, you know his 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 fortitude on the battlefield. Um, Nagash is still safe. Like he, he he expended some energy, but he's still out there kicking. You know, re, rejuvenating himself. Uh, he's got his more sharks still in, in I effect. Think, I think Archon confirms like he will now slumber for a hundred years. Yeah, exactly. So like Explains we know why that he's still groggy when we eventually see him in the Age of Sigmar. Oh, like, where's my coffee? Where's well, and, my coffee? And, <laughs> no, we don't need to get too much into it, but like a lot of these chapters of this book start in the same way that like the intros for all the audio dramas start where Nagash is like, it seems like he's waking up from a dream a little bit. He's like, <gasps> I'm super cool. Like everybody's, everything's still mine, right? Like it's a lot of, he's repeating a lot of the same refrain and <laughs> actually got repetitive a little bit, but I think I, I understand why. Um, well, is, but, that's all he thinks about. Yeah. That's the only thing he's like, how do, do I control everything still? Yeah. But, he's like, but, he's like, in a hole. Scrooge McDuck, except for his vault is full of bones. Sure. <laughs> Still swims in him like a like a pool. Uh, yeah, and Tamara's leading her her undead uh, clans, you know, from 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 the north. So I think that's where where our groups, our major, our players land at the end of the end of the book. All right. What should we do now? What should we talk about? I've got a couple of questions. Uh, do you have questions? I, we covered a lot of my questions, so I don't, I don't need to get, in, get into, into any of mine. Does anybody got some burning stuff they want to talk about? If Tamara is a Mortark, what is she the, the Mortark of? Mm. Despair. Kicking the butt. Mortark of Despair, because Nurgle came. They're taking away hope. She is the Mortark of Despair. Call it so she's the Mortark of Hope. No. Oh, contrary. Oh, yeah. fight, fight, fight. I was... I was thinking more Tark of the Ages. Sure. So ancestry and or rock, rock of Ages. Huh? More, <laughs> more rock. Workshop it. We'll get back to it. Yeah. yeah we'll so, figure it out. Well, what else? What else you got for? Me? You had mentioned MVPs. Sure, sure, sure. I reckon it's my dude. I liked. Uh, it was. It was like the perfect embodiment of like the flesh eater courts, and although. It's like quintessentially that. I don't know why, but like it was the first time he was the first time it ever resonated with me before. I guess it just today it clicked, I guess. Um, he's feral, but also had like a legitimate like claim to a throne, which I don't know. I've gotten a lot of that from the other, you know, couple of fictions that we've read for the Um mm-hmm. Plus, I like the idea of like, I don't know, I've always been a sucker for like reaching out to some like misunderstood force out there and using it to like, you know, defend whatever kind of like i don't know not the same thing but like the ghosts in lord of the rings right at the, that last right. battle like um somebody who maybe should no reason to help you but ends up doing it that's like a trope that i like but give me some other mvps i love neferata i thought she was fantastic like tavy said she loves you out. oh does that mean she's gonna try and turn me into a mortar because that might not work out well mm, we'll see uh just fully fleshed out as a character i've always liked her background her model etc in even in the old world so it's awesome to see her actually written well and with character and interest so that's fantastic i'm gonna go order the fly slash uh fester bite uh, without good and anta- like without engaging antagonists uh the story would not have nearly been as strong as it was and uh they're super interesting and uh helped it helped it be a whole cohesive thing that you're interested all the way through and I'm going to pick Tamara because nobody else did. Um, just her relationship to the dead um, is is something that that's fresh and new. Um, the idea that the dead are those to not just be respected, but to be commu- in community with. Um, and wrestling with the power to, she has the power to control the dead without their their will. But, cho- you know, how she chooses to... Um, work with them and and you know we're, you know not not bend to them but uh, you know lead them you know um, and so I think that 
uh, and this idea that she's just a part of this family uh, that is uh, going to be a force in the in in the realm of Shyish, and can't wait to see if if we get to see more of them in this series, or if there is a series, or you know that you know Josh Reynolds throws these characters and keeps them throughout other things. So I'm excited to see if if uh, Clan Rictus, uh, Mortark Rictus, uh, or Van Drek, or whatever it is, um, continues in another book. Hint, hint, Reynolds. Yeah. <laughs> you got to keep writing stuff about my, all the stuff. For my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are the questions you got? Anybody else? Bueller? All right, let's let's do let's do final reviews. Anything that we hadn't talked about, like what made you like it? Um, man, I already talked about all the things I liked about it. I'm just gonna reiterate: it was it was a great. Uh, I liked the setting. It was a window into um, a time period that we haven't read about before. It's informing the the present day fiction that we're reading these days. Um, it's a glimpse of uh, undead, or, you know, the, the death faction from a, from a more protagonistic perspective, um, and even the interplay between death and and Nurgle, it, it, it was like two sides that you typically end up rooting against, and I like that I was able to root for both of them, um, yeah. which was unique and fresh and all, all that jazz. Um, the characters were great, either both the ones that we've known before, you get them in, new, uh, in a new light and a new perspective, and then the new ones are also uh, fresh as well. And uh, one, one of the better one of the better reads. I'm not going to give it a number, but uh, Reynolds, you've done it again. <laughs> Um, I already talked about a lot of things I liked about it. Um, I'll say two big things. Uh, one, it increased the breadth of our knowledge about the Age of Sigmar universe, where we learned a lot more about how Shyish works, and the depth where we learned a lot more about how Nagash, who's a character we already knew, we learned more about his background, uh, how he came to be in the Sigmar's pantheon. He was imprisoned by the Chaos Gods in a, a crypt of forgotten moments, which, mmm, delicious phrase, right? Um, and Sigmar, you know, retrieved him from that. So we get some idea of like how he joined the Pantheon and how that fractured. So uh, increasing both the breadth and depth of our knowledge about the Age of Sigmar universe, world, whatever, um, really strong for, for both those reasons. Paul? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think it was written really, really well. Uh, the, but the only thing that holds it back is that it's just not <gasps> something that I'm really interested in, right? Like I'm not a huge fan of death. So it's a failing on your part. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I definitely enjoyed reading it. I didn't put it down, uh, etc. But like, it was not something that if there was any point that I was like, "Yeah, this is amazing," which I've done in most of our notes, other books when we talked about Spider Fang, when uh, Spear of Shadows, etc. Of course, of course, I'm a very specific man of a very specific taste. So um, I would probably give it six out of eight. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. I'm glad I read it. It really expanded on Mortal Realms, but it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, forces that are really push me towards uh, a, a different appreciation. I thought it was really good, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna give it 500 zombies out of 500 zombies, uh, mashed into a golem, crashing crashing out of the ocean in order to grab Nurgle and pull it to the depths. That's my rating scale for this one. Sure, sure. Um, I, I there were so many just kind of these cool moments uh, popping. Out of you know taking Gollum or you know a bone giant taking dire wolves taking you know uh, spectral ogres um, all these things that I wish I could see on the table with the 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 death line I think there's so many room so much room to kind of like uh, mix and match things um, and 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 then at the same time like just flips this relationship like like the death faction is is the protagonist like is the hero in this. Like, and, and you feel it, you know? Um, so I, I think that's, I, I didn't think that there'd be so much sentiment in a book that focuses on death. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, and uh, a cool thing is like uh, the Stormcast were not present except for. <gasps> I was going to bring that one. I forgot. Yeah. We all agree he got reforged, right? Like, yeah. Lightning bolt came down and took her brother up as he like that was that was crazy town. And what what's cool is like nobody knows what's going on because it's still in the age of age yep. of chaos. So like nobody knows that the the uh, stormcast are being. Made. And I was trying to look back at that. He's like he's an undead skeleton, right? And he's fighting, and that happens. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. He's already dead. Like mm, man, he's a relicter. 
Yeah. And I love the idea that like she picks up his sword like later on and it's still charged with energy. And she's like, ooh, yeah. ah. Like yeah, she yeah. That's not a bad call, yeah. Paul, because again, he comes from a tribe of of necromancers, right? Yep. He's a you know uh, he's not necessarily, you know, uh anyone we've heard of before, but uh if he if he had that necromantic skill when he was alive, there's a possibility well, he'd be a rocker. What's his face from Hammers of Sigmar? Like he's He's from death, isn't he? Like, yeah. um, did, yeah. did they have what's her last name? It's Von something. Von Drek. Von yeah. Drek. What's yeah. uh, I mean, I'm talking I'm talking about uh the the relictor from Hammers of Sigmar. What he's got a last Ionis name. Ionis is Cripborn is Uh-oh. Oh man, we don't need to draw this out. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, hey audience, look it up and look it up and put it in the comments and tell us. Guys, guys, shut up. Ionid Vendensed. Ben Dance, okay. I don't even care. Totally it's, so it's, it's not Drac, but yeah. uh, it's probably from, it could be from the that whole group. Yeah. Yeah, we know. Anyway. And with, All, and right. With it. All right. It is time for our reforging. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Comment below. Leave a review for us on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter. Davey, where can we find you on Twitter? At red underscore Zeke. How often? <laughs> Um, sorry. Mary. Wait, wait. That's not part of the script. <laughs> Where what can we find you? Uh, you can find me at, uh, at a bowler, B O H L E R, or A B O H L E R. Paul? At PJ Shard, P J S C H A R D. And in Chicago, uh, waiting for outside the Renaissance in until a hotel until Akon starts next year. Yeah, getting a gin and tonic in the hotel bar over and over <laughs> and over again. And you can find me at Stone Monk Gamer on Twitter. Um, thank you for watching the show, and we'll see you next time. Deuces. <laughs>